Thank you. I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's meeting, the meeting of Grant County Council, September the 28th, 2021. First thing on the agenda is the attendance. When I call your name, if you could just answer present, please. Councillor Wheat. Present. Thank you. Councillor McAlpine. Present. Councillor Ferrier. Present. Councillor Howes. Present. Councillor Bell. Present. Councillor Pierce. Present. Councillor Chambers. Present. Councillor Miller. Present. Councillor Coleman. Here. Councillor Gatward. Present. Attendance has been taken. Uh, second thing on the agenda is the approval of the agenda, noting that there's two things as an addendum. First one is 4.4, .4, which is Chuck Beach Energy Conservation and Demand Management Plan. And the other one is 12.1, which is a request from Councillor Bell regarding 23 Cedar Street. We'll talk more about that when we get there. Are there any other additions to the agenda? Seeing none, uh, Councillor Bell? Yeah, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Miller that the County of Brand agenda and addendum be approved. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, I'm I'm seeing that there's a bit of a lag for Councillor McAlpine when he votes. So we're going to take our time tonight, to make sure all the votes are clear. With that being said, number three on the agenda is the declaration of pecuniary interests. Does anyone have anything? If Councillor Bell? You're muted, Councillor Bell. When we come to the uh, committee reports for the Admin and Operations Committee, uh, there is one item regarding condominiums that I cannot vote on. Okay, thank you. Are there any other conflicts, Councillor Pierce? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. 13 3 and 14 3. 13 3 and 14 3. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Seeing none, we'll move on to number four on the agenda, which is the first of our delegations, and it's going to be Paul Emerson and David McNeil from the hospital. Welcome, David and Paul. Is Paul here? Paul is just joining. Okay, do you want to give him a minute or do you want to begin? I see him, it looks like he's just connecting. Okay. How are you, David? I am very good. Thank you for inviting us. No, no problem. Appreciate it. Paul, are you there now? Uh, yeah, I'm barely here. I'm just a second. I've got a weak connection. My apologies. Oh, here we go. Okay. Okay, I'm here. Thank you. Your okay, worship. thank you. Who, who wants to begin? So, Paul, you can begin. So, if you want to start. Okay, I'll go first. And uh, uh, thank you to the members of the council, Mr. Mayor, members of council, staff, for having us here. Uh, David and I apologize for being a little late. We, we just had a board meeting and uh, it went on and on because we were debating the vaccination policy for the hospital. And, but we came up with the unanimous decision. So, I'll share that with you at some point in time. But we're here tonight not to talk about that. We're here to talk about the, the um, steps that we're trying to take to get funding from the province to advance our efforts on the new hospital or rebuild hospital. I know we've talked to you about it already. Your mayor was a part of a master planning committee and um, we, we've kind of hit a stage where we're gonna need the support from our municipal partners and the First Nation communities we serve and a few others to, to move things forward to the next stage. And David, if I could turn it over to you, maybe you can talk about that and talk about the draft resolution we have to, to put in front of the Brant County Council. Yeah, great. So thank you, uh, Paul, for that. And uh, thank you to council uh, for um, uh, allowing us to, to do a presentation. I think in your materials, 
you know, we also wanted to highlight, um, you know, where the brain community healthcare system has come from over the last uh, couple of years um, and where we sit today in terms of our uh, financial position. Um, as you would have known, we um, did record a surplus this year due to a working capital infusion. Um, so that's uh, good news. And we've reduced significantly our working uh, capital deficit from $28 million to about $13 million. And we're continuing to see improvement uh, on that. Financially, we remain focused on the financial uh, status of the organization. And right now, uh, we are heading for um, another balanced position um, as we speak. And, you know, who knows what COVID will throw us, uh, but right now we're on that track. We just wanted to highlight a couple of other things uh, before we talk about the details of the, uh, the redevelopment work. Um, you know, our capital equipment, uh, we continue to have significant needs in our, in our capital equipment and uh, we are moving uh, forward with renewal of our capital equipment with the major uh, focus this year being on a second CT scanner. And uh, we're going out to market on October the 14th uh, for the installation of our second uh, CT scanner. That's a little bit over a $3 million uh, capital project once we include all of the equipment. You can leave the slide at the uh, first slide. Um, we are, we're also working uh, very closely uh, with our organization and, and actually our partners uh, to transform our digital health uh, um, or move forward with a digital health uh, renewal strategy. Um, and uh, by the March 2022, the board will be looking at approving uh, the revised digital health strategy for the brand community healthcare system. Um, and ensuring that that strategy is aligned with the changing directions in healthcare, in particular, to getting patients access to their information and making sure we're aligned with our OHT. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of the, the work that we've done at the Willett site. And as you know, as we think about capital redevelopment and the, and the, and the Willett site, which is in the Brant County in Paris, over the last three years, we've invested over $7.1 million in that uh, building. Uh, today, it has 51 actually 52 or 53 patients uh, in that building on a, on a daily basis uh, on inpatient wards. And uh, annually we're seeing close to 18 to 20,000 um, visits uh, at the Willett, uh, urgent Willett uh, Care Center. Um, and we are continuing the investments. Our, our, our x-ray machine there is at end of life. Um, and it's uh, about a three hundred and fifty to $500,000 cost to replace that. And so we're looking at strategies to do that. Uh, maybe if you can move to the next slide, please. As Paul has identified, um, can you move to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. The, um, you know, this is the Ministry of Health Capital planning process. It's not like you can just choose to uh, build a building in, in a hospital and then get going. Um, you have to get through uh, multiple levels of approval um, as we move forward. Where you see the, the note on there that says, we are here, uh, that really represents where we are in our projects for the emergency department. We actually um, have gotten approval to move to stage four. Uh, so we're now on the working documents for project one. Those working documents are tender documents uh, with all of the specifications. And we anticipate that those will be completed by December, um, at which time, again, we have to have those approved for the ministry before they can go to market. So we're, we're getting to that stage in, in the emergency department redevelopment, we're actually gonna see construction. Uh, if you look at the far uh, left-hand side, you will see something called the pre-capital uh, part A and B. That's where we are with the overall hospital um, redevelopment. Uh, as Paul mentioned, we did have a master planning steering committee um, that, was, that we took advice from our community leaders as to how we move uh, the redevelopment of the Brant Community Healthcare System forward. Um, that redevelopment will contemplate redevelopment on this site at the, at the Brant Community Healthcare System plus the redevelopment um, of the Willett site. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. Next slide, please. Um, so this represents uh, project one of our emergency department. So anything in gray is the existing emergency department. Um, and you can see that it's uh, well articulated that there's eight ambulances waiting in the parking lot there. Um, and it's sort of the, the reality that we face on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of our EMS providers and the great work that they're doing. Um, but anything in color is new um, emergency department space that will be developed uh, in uh, project one. Where we're putting our second CT, if you look on the right-hand side, you'll see some blue areas and right beside the uh, blue areas, you will see a, a, something that looks like a, 
a machine, and that's where we're putting our second CT. So you can see that it'll be well integrated uh, into our emergency department. Next slide, please. Once we get through project one of our emergency department redevelopment, uh, then we have to go through a very complicated phased approach of uh, actually um, renovating the entire uh, remaining portions of the existing emergency department. At the end of the day, you can see we'll have a large, almost double the size emergency department uh, to care for uh, the residents of, of Brantford and Brant County. Next slide, please. We're also doing, um, we, we have a wonderful service here at the Brant Community Healthcare System that um, has developed over the last uh, four to five years and that's our pediatric service. We moved from a pediatric service that had a couple of pediatricians to one now that has eight pediatricians and we have on-site pediatric coverage 24-7 um, and that's unheard of for most community hospitals of, of our size. One of the things that they do uniquely is take immediate referrals from family practitioners plus uh, divert patients from the emergency department or follow up immediately uh, the next day after a patient is discharged from the emergency department. And we call that the pediatric acute care referral service or pediatric quick care. Next slide, please. To give them a more modern space, we're doing a small redevelopment uh, in the hospital. You can see it's just four exam rooms and, and a waiting room. Uh, we are doing the specification documents for this work and we plan to move forward uh, with this by um, the new year and hopefully have it operational sometime uh, in the summer of 2022. Next slide, please. So the real piece that we are trying to move forward with is the emergency depart or the hospital redevelopment. Um, this is a, you know, a pretty um, high level overview of what we're proposing to do. Uh, anything in uh, red is existing buildings. Um, and those are existing buildings that will be retained. Uh, part of the directive uh, that the Ministry of Health had given to the organization, uh, even prior to my arrival, was that they wanted a plan that uh, contemplated the retaining of investments that had previously been made in the organization. So the building D-Wing, the concrete uh, precast building that you see as you're going up St. Paul Avenue is um, on, on the sort of bottom part of your slide. Um, the existing building C, which is relatively a modern facility, and anything that we're doing in the lower levels of the existing building B. The upper levels of the existing building B won't be usable for uh, patient carriers. They won't meet standards for any hospital space. We could use them for community beds, but majority of that space will be converted to administrative space simply because that's what it'll be uh, easily convertible to. We're uh, going across the, the Terrace Hill uh, street um, and you'll see a large uh, blue building that's a new hospital building um, and that's the where we're contemplating uh, putting a large uh, 470 bed uh, nine story uh, tower so that it will be a new modern uh, facility and uh, we can talk a little bit about the bed the capacity numbers um, as we move forward because the population projections on which we based the planning for the pre-capital submission a and b we're on the Ministry of Finance population projections and they underestimate the population growth that we know that we're experiencing. The next slide, please. So this is a, a rendition, rendering of, a, um, of what we propose that the new large uh, building might look like some days. I mean, this is really an artistic uh, rendering, uh, just a representational image. But the idea is Brantford and Brant County needs a new hospital to meet the needs. We know that most days in the last month, we've been running at about 104 to 108% occupancy. Um, we know these projects take significant amount of time to build and we don't have approval to get to stage one. And stage one I'm just is really just permission to plan. And that permission to plan to get through all of the requirements will take us about 12 months. It will cost us $3 million. And so what we're asking council is really to, you know, we need the voice of the community. This isn't about the hospital. This is about the community and we need the voice of the community to be strong um, so that it's being heard at Queens Park so that we can move forward with a simple request, quite honestly, of $3 million so that we can plan for the next 12 months the needs um, for this community um, as over the next 20, 30, uh, and really to the next 15 and 100 years. Um, clearly on this site, there will be lots of room for growth um, as we uh, remove some of the existing buildings. Um, we need to think about the service levels that are available here. 
And we also um, have plans to expand the, the scope of services at the Willett site, looking at a dialysis unit, uh, continued function of uh, community beds, continued urgent care um, with a diagnostic uh, service facility there to service that uh, community, a multi-service a multi service, uh, site. So that's my presentation. Uh, there is a motion that I know that council has and happy to have any conversation. Paul, I don't know if you would like to take it over here. Well, well, no, David, I think you did a good job and in the interest of the council's time, let's just turn it back. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you both. Are there any questions of the delegation? Uh, Councillor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Dear to David and Paul, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, two questions. Uh, does a provincial election slow the process down or do you guys take advantage of it by uh, squeezing the candidates? <laughs> well, I mean, I think the timing is everything, right? The, we need to be on, you know, we know an election's happening in 10 months. So we need to be, we're advocating now loudly so that we're not ignored um, by government as the political process for re-election um, gets, gets started. Um, and and you, know, you know, it is a political question, and, but this is a patient care question. Um, we know today, I mean, I know this county deals with some of the issues, or council deals with some of the issues that we face and, and its capacity. So um, yes, a provincial election is playing into this. Uh, we need to make sure our voice is heard because there's lots of voices out there. Um, and we need to make sure this is the loudest. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question, and <laughs> I gotta ask this because we're told to ask this because you guys don't uh, come before us every month, so we don't get you that often. But, um, and David, in your presentation, I think you had, a, you were showing what, what was it, eight ambulances in that photo, or eight ambulance spots. So um, what action items uh, have you taken lately or will be taking soon uh, to reduce the waiting times for ambulances? And timing is everything because uh, we're actually uh, looking at putting another ambulance on the road next year and that always uh, hits the budget pretty hard. So what, what, what are you guys doing about that issue for us? Yeah, so I think, you know, ambulance offload is really a canary in the coal mine around the health of the, the healthcare system. Um, so we're doing all we can to work with your providers. We do have working groups um, with our providers at an operational level. I know recently we had the opportunity to um, meet with uh, Mr. Bradley and uh, Paul and my, myself and our clinical lead to talk about the issue of ambulance uh, offload. Um, there are what I would say system issues that need to be addressed related to ambulance. There are some operational issues on, on both sides of, that we need, to, um, we need to deal with. And I think it's just that working together that we can work to, to try to solve this problem um, to the greatest extent possible. It goes back to whether, when you're at 108 to 100 percent occupancy, there are challenges with flow, but you know, there's small improvements we'll continue to make. Okay, thank you. Councillor How is your next, and then Councillor Pierce, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you, um, to David and Paul. Um, thank you for the presentation. I, I really appreciated seeing the, the condensed version of, of the, the vision um, for the future. And I'm, my question is, is there a, a likewise condensed version of this that's public facing? Like, uh, do we have an opportunity to share this vision with, with the public? What's the easy way to, to help other people see um, what, what, what the vision is so that they can help maybe try to lend support to, to, to making it happen? And great question. And, 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 you know, what part of what I'm doing is maybe not so a condensed presentation, but um, doing presenting to um, groups uh, throughout, uh, throughout our community um, on a regular basis, uh, really just to share, share that vision uh, with them. Uh, part of part of sh part of that sharing is doing what we're doing here today, sharing with council, giving a report, so that um, we try to hit all these venues. So very similar to what we're doing um, here, I do um, with our groups at the um, you know the Lions clubs, the Kiwanis clubs, and and uh, you name the clubs. Whoever will listen to me, we we will we will talk to them. 
Probus clubs. I think I have one up coming up in the next uh, couple of weeks. And um, so we're using all of those venues. Um, we do do a report to the community on, a, on an annual basis uh, through our annual report. And generally I do a year end report to the community through the, through the, um, through, through a, you know, a column that we have from uh, Gary Chalk, who does a column for us on a regular basis. And I just give an update, uh, you know, usually in December and basically say, here's what we accomplished. Here's what's going ahead. So any other venues like that, we will continue to use and we will continue to expand. Okay. Thank you. If I could just jump in there, uh, Councillor House, if we could, Maybe David, we can get something printed out or, or electronic that we can send. And because I understand, I think what Steve's talking about that getting out there in the community, they see somebody hand them something might just be a little easier for those that are working with us to advocate. Sure. We can talk about. It. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, thank you. Yeah, I, I do. I do think there's an opportunity for uh, the average uh, resident. Of, of County of Brant or Brantford, they, they may not read your annual report. Um, they, they may not dive deep into your website, but if, if we had an opportunity to share with them a, uh, a snapshot of, of what the vision is, as, as, as well explained as you did it tonight, um, I think a lot of people would appreciate seeing that vision and, and then might start paying more attention to some of the political decisions that, that might lend itself to the, the achievement of those goals. So, thank you. Great, happy to work with you on that. Councillor Pierce, your next please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Uh, yeah, to David and Paul and to all the Brant County Health Services, first of all, thank you for what you do. Um, I know it's, uh, I think everybody understands the fact that uh, it, it's, it's overwhelming at the two hospitals we do have here with the number of people that, uh, uh, that we're supplying a service to so appreciate that and I understand it's a it's a long road. Um, first of all, you know the just the, the sound of you know potentially 400 plus more beds that's that's fantastic and, and I think it's going to you know potentially ease a little bit of the strain on there um, and you know super exciting the fact that there's more things happening with the Willet I think that's just a win win for everybody so that's fantastic. The question I have and I, and, I'm, and I'm bringing it up to you guys in this forum. Are there, I know there's going to be conversations about what's going to be in this new building and that sort of thing. Um, a little thing that happened just, just last week in regards to uh, um, somebody called me up as far as uh, life labs with, uh, you know, giving blood and that sort of thing. Um, there's one in Paris and there's two in Brantford at this point in time. Like, I'm not sure how that goes. Is that something that's discussed of, of population wise? Like, are we under lab for that sort of thing? Is there that type of um, uh, possibility of having something more in there? I'm just... You don't have to get right into it, but I'm just curious if those are in your discussions that you're having with this. Yeah, so I think you're, are you referring to the Willet site to have more services there? There and Brantford, yeah. Like I say, I think there's just, a, just with our population growing and it's not just, it's not just the county in Brantford, it's the surrounding area that comes in as well. And we all know that. I think it's just the fact of, you know, with the Life Labs in general, just the, the, the weights and the, and the number of folks that they're, they're seeing on a daily basis. I think there were, we may be just under lab. And is that the type of thing that might go into this new building or potential another one for the Willet? I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, at the Willet site, I do think we, as I've said, we do plan to have a diagnostic type of center there so that it would, you know, prevent people having to come from the main site for, you know, simple x-ray lab, ultrasound um, types of uh, diagnostic um, services. So we have, uh, you know, an x-ray suite there right now, um, but yes, in terms of you know addressing the broader um, needs, the labs in particular are run you know they're privately, uh, provincially funded. Um, yeah. So I think that you know you know the new lab licenses there is a process through the ministry to get those new lab licenses. I think Ontario health teams um, are the mechanism by which you know working together as a community we can start to um, have those conversations. We're not an island as a hospital. We work with our partners where, you know, our mission really is to focus on working together to build that healthier community. And through the Ontario health team, that's going to be the mechanism by which um, we get these services. And we're starting to see that, um, particularly the community-based services, all of the new funding initiatives for particularly community-based mental health services are really being directed to that Ontario health team uh, mechanism and uh, that's a developing mechanism we have so I think that was you know where we would we'd partner with others to make that happen. Okay thank you and thanks again for what you do. John one other thing there as you know in the new health hub that you're building yep. there's going to be a life lab there. Yep too. 
Yep. Thank Council, you. Councilor Ferrier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to David and Paul. Um, just well, first of all, thank you uh, so much for the uh, coming today and also um, the enhanced service at the Willet that I've been hearing really great things about from people in the community and in the ward and in the broader community as well. Um, and for the work being done with the paramedic services as well. Um, we hear reports from uh, Russ uh, uh, at paramedic services, Mayor Bailey, uh, Councillor Pierce, myself and the Brantford uh, committee members about the working relationship and some of the things around like the monitoring and the reporting. And uh, we know efforts are there. When I have two questions, I guess. One is, you know, you talked about structural issues and I imagine that may be code for growing population and, and funding um, because we see that with paramedics as well, that, you know, we're at the high nineties, low hundreds in terms of capacity and you're in the 104, 108 range. Um, so yeah, I see a nod there. So I don't need to answer that one, I guess. Uh, the other one would be, would there be interest from somebody from that working group coming to present at the paramedic services committee once or twice a year just to see what we can do because I mean I look at that committee we meet every two two months and we have members of both Brantford Council and County Council and staff there and and I'm wondering if there might be some connect there where we can broadly work together and maybe that may, helps make the case around the need for funding of paramedics uh, including enhanced funding over the years and, and and if there's any savings we can find how can we route that fairly to both organizations, right? Would that be of interest at all to come once or twice a year um, to speak at paramedic services? Um, I, I think we'd be happy to do that. And I would defer to, to Mr. Bradley as well, but um, we'd be happy in, to have members of the working group uh, that are working together right now to try to deal with some of the offload challenges, come forward and, and really present, you know, what are the issues? So people understand like, what are the issues that are driving some of it, and, and some of it's just simply improvement work, but some of it's just the volumes are just so high, right? So I think that would be, I think that would be useful. The, the more transparent we can be about these things and, and the more that we can see the work that's being done, then people will understand the challenges. Thank you. And yeah, maybe we can work creatively for some uh, greater solutions all together. So appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Bell and then Councillor Gatward, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Matthew, you too, uh, David and Paul. Um, firstly, when I read your report, I was really pleased to see that the finances of BCHS are much, much better than they were five or six years ago when the whole issue of the potential closure of the Willet came on the table. Uh, and just to reiterate what others have said, uh, we're thrilled that the Willet is in development and I hope we can develop it further. And together with the new health hub, Paris actually and the county collectively uh, is getting a double bonus there. Rather than having nothing, we've got two things. But my, my question to you would be, um, we're in a competition for provincial funding for a new hospital. Do you, do you have a sense of the relative degree of urgency that Brantford and, and County of Brant has relative to other parts of the, the province? Uh, and assuming that we are relatively competitive in that situation, what would be your best estimate of the timeline before a new hospital was built? So, you know, I, I don't have all of the data, but but I will tell you from my, my perspective, um, you know, I come from Northern Ontario where, you know, and the, the large, every large center in Northern Ontario um, has a newer hospital than you do here in Brantford. I mean, every hospital is like, you know, 10 to 15 years at the, at the oldest, um, not even 15 years, 12 years um, since it's been redeveloped. So it's, to me, the, the need is, is like urgent. Um, I think of, from a facilities uh, perspective, um, it is, you know, one of the most needed redevelopments in the province from the quality of the facilities, particularly when we look at the B Tower and the state of the inpatient units. You know, I can't underestimate how difficult COVID was for us logistically because primarily our rooms are not private rooms. We have no capacity there. You know, most of you know, they're three bed rooms uh, within that tower. And then you try to start to isolate people. Um, it doesn't have the uh, isolate, uh, in, you know, the ventilation capacity. Um, and, and so it's significant. In terms of the timeline question, um, you, you know, best case scenario, you're 15 years. Um, that's the best case scenario. And, 
you know, if we fast track this and money would flow for, for the size, I mean, we're talking a billion plus dollars here, um, you know, and the money would flow that fast, you know, you might be able to do it in 10 years, but that's getting everything approved. Um, and I would, I'd say at lightning speed. So, you know, I think I've said in the paper, time is ticking, time is ticking. And, and we need a solution and, um, you, you know, that 15 years, I don't think I'll be here in 15 years. But uh, I'll be really old then. But uh, but um, um, it's it's urgent, and and I guess it's that compelling piece that I'm really just saying to the community: we need we need the voice because this will take a long time. Thank you. Sorry, that's kind of a winding answer. I apologize. Well, thank yeah. you, uh, Councillor Bell. If I could just add to that too. Uh, first of all, I'm sitting right now in a little hotel in a little community in Newfoundland, Port of Basque. And right across from me, as I was out in the parking lot talking to you this afternoon, David, I saw the brand new hospital. So you talk about Northern Ontario, it's right across the country, I think. But, um, but we have been starting to do what we can behind the scenes to try and move this forward, even without approval. So um, we have been acquiring land. We have been doing different things like that under David's leadership, uh, working with functional designers and this kind of thing. So that hopefully when we get this approval from to, to move ahead with phase one, we'll be able to fast track this thing because as a community, we have to do that. No question. Thank you, Councillor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I'd like to thank the two delegations for your very informative presentation and for all your work that you've put in on this project. It's, it's exciting, it's overdue, and I'm so pleased that it's moving forward. And I'm wondering, I expect you do, but do you have a list of all the county service clubs? Um, we will get them if we yeah. don't. Uh, I, yes, I think I know where you're leading, but we will get that. It's yeah, when when um, David McNeil, you said you were going out into the community, which is a great idea, and there could be a lot of support and um, excitement created by visiting some of the county. Um, now, I'm not sure how many of them are still meeting because of COVID currently, but perhaps in the future when things open up a bit more. Um, that's just something I wondered. And thank you again for moving the project forward. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, I'd just like to thank you again for what you've done too with the Willet. Um, I had an opportunity to need the Willet for a month for my mother this year and the care that she received was unbelievable. And uh, so thank you for doing what you've done for, for the county by doing as much as you've done for the Willet, because I know it was a little shaky for a little while, but it's a, it's a wonderful place and uh, the county does appreciate it. Uh, I think whatever you can give us in a package would be appreciated because uh, once you had your little bit of uh, publicity the other day, uh, I, got, I had a call actually from a doctor today and two people, uh, just citizens, and they were, they were actually surprised to hear that the decision to just do a rebuild instead of a new hospital um, had been decided for, for a very long time. So I think that we need to tell people what we're doing and, and how long, who made those decisions because uh, you know there's a lot of people that think you should be doing a new build somewhere. So I think we need to straighten out um, things and let people know exactly what the process was to get to where we are now. And I think that if you could put a package together for council, we could, through phone calls and through the county, we could, we could offer that information as factual and not just something that we've We've heard, or that we, you know, that's, that's going around uh, since the articles in the newspaper. So maybe you could incorporate that with what you bring to us. That would be great. Yep. Okay, uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, I'm just going to say I, I think I received a call from the same doctor, um, and 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 yes, we do have to do a better job communicating. I agree, but there has been communication over the last two years. The committee that you sat on, where we passed that motion, that was. That was on the website, that was in the, uh, and I think our social media, it was in the newspaper, but 
you know what it's like at the county level. It's just so hard to communicate, like so hard to, to get things out there. There's not a broadcast nowadays. It's all sort of individual cast that get certain segments of our community. And, uh, and do, it does fall between the cracks, but it's still incumbent upon us to do as good a job as we can. And we heed your advice and follow up for sure. Yeah, well, thank, thank you both for, for what you do. Uh, with that being said, no other questions. Councillor Wheat, you have something to bring yeah. forward? Yes, I do. It's moved by myself, second by Councillor McAlpine. We had resolved that the council requests that the government of Ontario immediately grant permission to the BCHS to plan for the redevelopment of the BCHS and to also provide the necessary funding to enable the Brant Community Health Care System to move forward with stage one of planning for this critically important project. Thank you, Councillor Wheat. Everyone's clear of the motion. Uh, I'd like to call the vote. All those in favor of that motion? Is there anyone opposed, just for the record? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate thank you so it. much. Thank, thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Moving, moving, moving on. Moving on to 4.2, please. Uh, Mr. Uh, Balterman uh, has concerns about the planning and development in the county. Welcome, welcome. Uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for taking me again. Uh, we met on a previous issue about a year ago. Um, I was a little less professional, um, so I apologize. I'll try and be a little cleaner this time. So I've spoken to uh, quite a few residents. We've been having some severe concerns with the overflow parking from the rentals in the towns, uh, blocking people's driveways, uh, general malaise when they leave oil stains, when residents who live on the street are uh, approach them and say, hey guys, uh, do you mind maybe cleaning that up? And they flip them the bird and walk off. Um, so the proposal that uh, I discussed uh, in the letter that I sent out to you guys, I'm not sure if you got it, um, but it had, I'd lived in Oakville before and I've lived in other cities where you were able to purchase permit parking in front of your house. Um, and you could, add, and any of your guests that came to stay at your house or, or family or whatever could sign in on the Brant bylaw and put in their, uh, their, geez, their license plate. And uh, with that, it protects them from being ticketed um, because I know we have you, uh, the County of Brand has not assumed the street so far. Um, I know it's coming. Um, so that's one issue is obviously the overflow from rentals in the townhouses. Uh, we feel that there was inadequate parking provided to those townhouses. There's, I think, six visitor parking spots for an obscene amount of town uh, amount of townhomes. So uh, we would like you guys to look at other options. Um, because where that park was built, I know there's some commercial space in the zoning behind it. Perhaps you could uh, put a little chunk there for a small parking lot for them. Uh, that's what everybody in the uh, in this development um, close to me that are being directly affected have uh, thought would be a good idea. Um, secondly, because I only have two minutes, I'm not going to go too great into detail. Um, but at the end of our street, uh, Vic Chambers and Rest Acres, there's no roundabout. Um, there's no means to cross the street. Um, all of the amenities in the near vicinity that are in walking distance are unaccessible except by car or walking a good, what, three, four kilometers to the light near the close to King Road. Um, so what we proposed in the letter that I sent to, uh, to the councillor was that we put not a full cross, not a full stoplight, but uh, a pedestrian crossing um, where you have a, a push button. And then a single red light goes, the people have adequate time to cross over. Um, this goes for kids because a lot of the kids here have friends in the development across Rest Acres and the parents are kind of getting annoyed that they all have to drive back and forth. The kids can't take care of themselves and cross safely. Um, so that was another major issue uh, brought up by several of the residents on all three streets. These streets are McGovern, Vic Chambers and Tom Brown. Um, also, um, I'm not sure if we talked about this when we were talking about the uh, low rise apartments and, uh, you know, we didn't want the back to back towns due to the increased renting. Um, there was some some comments made about, you know, renters and so on and so forth. What are we doing as a as a county uh, in limiting 
I guess, the amount of renters in these uh, townhomes? Because I know a lot of these properties over here, uh, if you guys actually went and checked if any of the residents are living in there, um, it's probably, I'd say 30% are rented. Um, that's just a, a modest estimate from speaking with neighbors. Um, so it's perhaps something you can look at because some of them have four or five people in a single unit. Therefore, you have five cars or four cars. And guess what? Inadequate parking means they're parking on everybody's street. When my guests come over and have to park two blocks away with three kids to travel because there's no spots on our street, I think it's ridiculous. I'm not the only one that encountered this either as well. Um, so, because when I, if I paid extra for a separate entrance to my basement, so I was also told, I called, I said, I was going to finish my basement. They said, that's great. You're going to make it a rental. You have to register. So I have to register my detached home who has a separate entrance when I finish the basement, if I intend to rent, but none of the homeowners that buy the townhouses have to follow the same rules. I just find that a little odd. Um, possibly you could look at that as well. Um, maybe limit the amount of renters per unit um, because they have that in Hamilton. I'm sure they have it in every country or every county, municipality. Uh, city. So perhaps it's something you guys could look at. Uh, another big thing, um, I spoke to the operations manager and the bylaw manager, and uh, there seems to be a consensus within your operations department, maybe not the management or the or anybody driving the bus, but the people that are driving the snow plows hate plowing our area uh, because it's on a steep grade. And with that steep grade, you have uh, these trucks weaving around cars in icy conditions, uh, making it dangerous, and they can't complete their job safely. Uh, in that proposal that I submitted, it stated that uh, maybe you guys could put in a block on parking on the street in the winter so everybody can have a nice plowed street. And uh, we're not putting any operations staff in danger of slipping and sliding uh, while weaving around all of the cars. Uh, I think there's one other issue we'd like to talk um, I'm not sure if you've been hearing about uh, the, if any of the, the, the residents have been speaking to any of the counselors about the roundabout usage. Um, I used to drive standard, so roundabouts are beautiful for me. Um, however, there's a lot of talk of uh, people's inability to use them properly. I'm not sure if, I don't see any signs about signaling intent. Um, if you go to Kitchener, You'll see signs, Kitchener Waterloo, you see signs in a lot of the roundabouts that uh, pretty much tell people when you signal your intent for, through the, through the uh, roundabout intersections, we don't have anything like that. Because um, a lot of the people that are moving out here are coming from you know Oakville, Mississauga, Brampton, Toronto, uh, and there's not a lot of roundabouts out there. So um, perhaps you guys could, if you'd like, I do technical writing as well as engineering. I can write a, I can write the cut sheet for you and issue it to the people, whatever you'd like. We just, we think you need to uh, either put some signage or send some communication to people to, uh, to limit because I see at least almost two accidents a week. Um, so something you, you all could please consider. Uh, a lot of the residents are a little weary of driving in the roundabouts uh, due to you know, people not knowing how to drive in them. And uh, one final issue, um, due to the increased population density in the area, um, I'm sure you're all aware that Rest Acres used to be just a straight shot for transport trucks. Uh, so which wasn't too bad because there was only, uh, you know, residents at near King Road, um, not a lot of foot traffic because there wasn't really anything up this way, um, not a whole lot. We're seeing, you have transport trucks coming down Rest Acres now, uh, weaving through the, uh, excuse me, navigating the roundabouts, um, therefore halting all traffic in three or four directions uh, because they take up two lanes, which I understand. I mean, it's just science. However, um, I think Bishop's Gate should be explored. Um, I know there's some land there that, you know, is owned by some people, but perhaps in the next couple of years, you guys could look at possibly making an exit over there as well um, to have a little bit straight, a little bit more of a straight shot with a lower density area, because even with the houses going up over there, the, the density, uh, I guess the density ratio of population with families and stuff is going to be higher on Rest Acres and Bishopsgate. And then they still gain access to King Road, which they can gain access to Cambridge when you just follow that around. 
and you got King Road. I'm just, just, just a, just something that we all talked about. Um, really, though, the biggest thing that everybody is kind of uh, was was really on board with was the uh, the permit parking. So I'd really, I understand. I'm not going to tell you who, but somebody in your bylaw department, and it wasn't in management; it was a bylaw officer. Um, actually told me that you have all already instituted some permit parking, uh, in other places in the, in the area. I think one is near the river, um, cause the residents are not able to park their cars near their house. Um, I actually, when I first moved here, I called by law, i moved here two and a half years ago and I called and spoke to by law and offered this up and they said, no, we don't do that. And then I find out that you guys are offering it in two other places in the city right now. Um, so we really would like if you guys would consider this, we understand that there would be a cost associated with it. Um, and everybody has accepted uh, that cost being added to their taxes, providing that it's a reasonable amount. Um, we would let you guys set that amount and uh, put that communication out if you uh, all decide that that's uh, something we could do. Because at the end of the day, our guests can't park in front of our house. So we're, we're all getting a little annoyed. So please uh, take this matter uh, seriously because you guys are about to assume the, street, assume the streets very soon. Uh, Vic Chambers, Tom Brown, and McGovern, and I'm assuming the semis, which don't have any parking, will not be affected uh, because they're semis and there's not a lot of green space in their front for parking. So please consider this. Uh, and again, if I'm sure. Did you all receive the communication? I'm assuming you did. Okay, fantastic. If you don't mind, if you require a petition, every single person will sign the petition. So if you require a petition, but we ask that you set that petition at a reasonable number, not like the last time where it was 500 signatures with 100 residents. So please keep that in mind if you uh, if you if you would require a petition. Uh, other than that, uh, that's all for today, and I appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, hear us out. Thank you. Are there any questions to the presenter? Councillor Bell? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, Mr. Voltman. Uh, thank you for your input. I think there are elements of what you've raised which have merit and we should, as a county, reflect on. Um, speeding is a universal issue. Parking is a constant challenge. Uh, we're working to make winter road clearing more effective and some of your ideas about uh, taking vehicles off the road in winter, uh, they're already being tested and trialled in other parts of, of, of the county. Uh, as someone who's driven around roundabouts for 40 years, a lot of them, a lot of that time outside of Canada, you're quite right, there's an awful lot of learning to go on and, and maybe we can do better in terms of education. We're working towards provincial support for a new 403 junction at Bishopsgate Road. And at the county end, we're already starting work uh, in preparation for that with new roundabouts in Falkland to make a, a bypass for uh, heavy traffic around Paris. Um, once that's available, then the heavy goods load demand on rest acres will diminish. I can't tell you the timeline on that from the province. Um, I do want to take uh, exception to a couple of things you said. I think you, you disregard some of the history of the Mile Hill development. Um, you talk about a dream that you were sold. Well, you were sold by developers uh, who were fully aware of the plans for Mile Hill, which just for the benefit of people listening, uh, the site plan from 2014 had townhomes that you were challenging not so long ago. It had two four-story uh, apartment blocks. It had one three-story apartment block. In terms of total dwellings, nothing has changed since the early days of the development planning. So I think you just need to have that in mind as you go forward. Uh, the, the 2014 plan basically confirms what you saw in the 2018, 2019, 2020 proposed updates. And I think just, just a, a, a comment, you know, I think to you and all, all of the people living in that part of, of the uh, town, I hope that your lawyers and your real estate agents gave you good advice and that they shared with you information that was readily available. There are no, should be no surprises there. 
with regard to the number of dwellings, what was going on in terms of development. This is, there's nothing new there. And I think just, I want to finally say that as a council, we have a responsibility to encourage multiple forms of development and accommodate residents with varying financial capability. And that includes people that might want to rent. And that's going to become more evident as we introduce the new official plan next year. We're going to be encouraging more rental properties, more low rise buildings, intensification of existing built up areas. And, and we need, it's, it's an urgent priority for us as a county council to support the building of more affordable and attainable homes. Uh, as, as the county grows to 59,000 people, there's room and demand for all kinds of development. So I think what you're seeing is just a taste of what will come. And I think you know, we have to learn from it as a county to do better, at, particularly around things like parking, and that's been made aware to our planning department. But you, know, just, you do have to recognize we are working within provincial guidelines. We're working within existing official plans and zoning bylaws. We, we can change them, but we haven't changed them yet. So I appreciate all your inputs. We'll take what we can from it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Are there any other questions or comments to the presenter? Seeing none, what, uh, Councillor House? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you um, to the delegation, I, I just had one very specific question and I'm, I'm, I'm racking my brain trying to remember a time during our term, which is which is your term, <clears throat> you've lived here for uh, three years, two and a half years, I think you said. So that's almost exactly the, the time of our term. I'm trying to remember a time during that period where A, we required a petition and B, where we required a petition of 500 signatures. That's, that's not ringing a bell to me. And you, you concluded your thorough presentation with that information. I was wondering if you could uh, refresh my memory on where that came from. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there was a, there was a, quite a few people involved in, uh, in when I was in that meeting about the attempting to block the low rise in the back-to-back uh, -back towns. There was another uh, lady just up the street um, there was another gentleman in the townhomes that actually went around and issued the uh, petition that was actually uh, from the county. They're like they said that they got this. I'm sorry to say this. This is third party information. It was given to every single resident here. And it was they stated the individual who was acting on behalf of some of the residents after speaking to somebody in city council. This had a county of Brant logo on it, the whole nine yards. I'm sure I might be able to find a copy for you. If you'd like, I can get that copy and send it over to you guys to review after. Because uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm going to be uh, pretty blunt. I'm an objective individual. You know what I mean? I'm an engineering guy. I don't really play with emotion all that often. Uh, I may lose my temper on occasion, but I'm, I'm an objective guy. So if I make that statement, it's uh, perhaps that petition came. Maybe you guys weren't notified, but somebody told this individual we had to submit this petition to, to attempt to shut this down, maybe for it to be heard at another, uh, another meeting. I was just conveyed because I had a copy of it in hand. So I can get another copy of it uh, just, to, just to show you guys. And it did have the County of Brant header on it um, with the actual map of the plan, the whole nine yards. So uh, it's possible that some rogue member in the office may be... Uh, said that we should do this because I unfortunately did not lead that operation of the obtaining the petition signatures. So that's where that came from. Um, I'd also just like to, uh, to add one thing uh, to the previous gentleman as well, uh, what he stated um, with respects to the patients. Believe you and me, we have been quite patient. We understand that when you talk, it's, it sounds fancy when we say affordable housing, but uh, that these affordable townhouses are six and seven hundred thousand uh, dollars. Uh, apparently, that's affordable nowadays. Uh, you know, what? I grew up in the gutter, man. And back in the day, those houses were fifteen grand in Hamilton. So seven hundred thousand. I make I make seventy grand a year. I don't make a lot of money, and seventy grand a year, I can barely afford a seven hundred thousand dollar home. So 
uh, these people that are buying these and flipping them for rent, do you think they're renting them for $500 a month to low income or medium income families? No, it's Toronto rate rents. So I, that's why I asked you guys, urged you guys to investigate all these rentals, because I assure you that these rentals are actually for profit, which they should be, but to what extent? So when we say throw, throw terms around like affordable housing, uh, coming from somebody that grew up in affordable housing, this ain't affordable housing. So just keeping it real, objective. But thank you again. Uh, so I, if you'd like, I will get that petition from uh, the gentleman. I can't remember his name. He's a Spanish gentleman, super nice guy. Uh, I will get a copy of that and forward that over to you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Councilor Ferrier, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I can probably clarify on the on the petition. It, it was done by members of the community who had met with several members of council, but it wasn't a it wasn't a, it was a community piece. They they might have gotten a, a a graphic off a website and put it on. And I know they got a map, but uh, I know we had met at the uh, sports complex in the county of Brant, not the city of Brant. And we met at the sports complex, and there was hundreds of people that signed, and uh, it was wonderful. But that was an example of members of council and the community working together and coming to a good decision as a group and and um and actually the developer standing down as well so i mean that was a good story it, it kind of almost sounds like it was a negative story where we forced folks to get 500 signatures but that's not the case at all and we were there and in fact some members of council uh, were very supportive uh, uh in the planning stages of of some of that helping uh to uh empower people like moira uh, who was one of the people who was organizing that that might have been the nice lady you were talking about but I just I just want to ask the the presenter, you know, Alan, what you're asking for is some some enforcement in some of these things. Like I, I agree with Councillor Bell, there's some things that you know we we are working on, some things we're going to take into account. But what what powers do you think the county has to dictate rent? And and again, on private, like we don't have the right to tell you how much to rent your place for if you ever decide if your situation changed. And just to also let you know, I know at least two, if not three members of this council have grown up in public housing in, you know, um, more than affordable housing, public housing, government housing. And we do work with a lot of members of the community and, uh, and even the development community to try and build more, um, which is part of this. But I, again, we can't tell folks not to rent. We can't tell folks what to set the rent, set the rent at. Um, that's not even a bylaw piece. That's That's just but that's just human rights. <laughs> so I'm just wondering on the enforcement side, what, what do you, like, is there something tangible you want that maybe you've missed in your presentation? Uh, that's actually, that's actually great. Uh, I, I like the way you put it. Um, so you're right. You, you, you have no, you have no bearing on the rent being set. However, when you're, it, we're in a council meeting and one of the comments is affordable housing that is clearly not affordable. It kind of diminishes the the count the, the the county's stand on affordable housing, because um, realistically speaking, like I said, when we planned when you planned the townhouses and you planned whatever else you're planning, right? Um, parking needs to be a it's it's already having an impact and it's not a positive impact. I could understand if it was one or two cars, but you have people parking on our grass. There's there's just utter disdain in in. in I don't know how to say this. Like I said, maybe I end up back in the gutter, but I will end up back where I am now because <laughs> that's just my personality. But what, on the sidebar, uh, thank you for the background information on the, uh, on the, on the petition uh, because I kind of stepped away. I, you know, it left a bad taste in my mouth. I felt that the meeting uh, you know, kind of didn't yield the same result. I felt like it, it was kind of redundant. It wasn't going to work out, but I do appreciate that you guys took the time. It, it really does mean a lot. Um, uh, working with the community, obviously, uh, we like that uh, that interaction. So, with all respect about the rent, um, I understand. But when you're packaging it in a meeting, this is the second time that we spoke about this when we were shoot, trying to shoot down the other thing about the with with the Lasani change. Um, there was talk of affordable housing. None of this twenty three hundred dollars in rent is not affordable. That's Toronto condo. So, um, if you're going to present, you know, a diverse community, and I get it. Like I said, I'm from the gutter. So with all due respect, I mean, when we're talking about affordable housing and it's not affordable housing, I think we should just stop using that term at the council meetings when it's not going to be affordable, never. <laughs> so, um, but as for the rent in Hamilton, uh, in other counties, there is a limit to uh, zoning 
rental properties and uh, council should council. I'm pretty sure does have an impact on that. Um, otherwise you'd have, that's why not every single person on my street was able to get a separate entrance. Like I did, they had to check the permits. If it was allowed, then I get it. Not every single person is able to get it on my street. So that's obviously set by the county. So that's why I'm, that's kind of where I'm going with this. I'm just saying we need to we need to find a happy medium so we don't have so many renters that this explodes. And that's why the preemptive measure was permit parking, so the residents can protect their basically their areas where people aren't blocking their driveways, wrecking their grass, and general disdain. I mean, if somebody came and blocked your driveway halfway in the car, and then when you came out, you said, "Hey, dummy, what are you doing?" and they flipped you the bird. Pretty sure you're going to have the same reaction that all of us had. Eventually, it's going to be an uprising, right? Now, all of the residents, I'm telling you firsthand, I'm sorry, this is so sidebar, but every single person on our street right now in the other street are now parking their straight, their cars on the street to block them from using the parking. So <laughs> I, I, I just, I want to make that drive that point home, but I appreciate uh, the, the background on the petition. Thank you for filling me in. I was a little blind on that. And, and thanks Thank for you. the insight. Thank you, Councillor Bell, and then Councillor Pierce, and then we're going to hear from Pam. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Mr. Volterman. Uh, don't take my comment about affordable housing in isolation. It's not necessarily in your backyard. I'm talking about the whole county. And, and what you have in your backyard is clearly attainable housing because people are attaining it. But I want to take up the point about residents and parking permits. You referred to some people uh, down by the river that have uh, acquired parking permits, just for information, they don't have a drive, they don't have a garage. The only parking they have is in front of their house. Now, every home on My Hill Development has both a garage and a drive. So you start from a much different position. Thank you. Councillor Pierce. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the delegation, uh, a few of my statements have already been made by uh, fellow councillors, so I appreciate that. One thing I want to, to go back on to the uh, delegation, Alan, you, you spoke of having to go out to Rest Acres Road and go all the way down to King Edward to go across the lights to come back up as far as walking. We have two fantastic multi-use pathways down, the, down both sides of Rest Acres Road with several roundabouts going down through there. I'm curious as to why you would why you would walk all the way to King Edward Street and come back up when at the roundabouts, um, which is the opposite of downtown at the, at the traffic pump, at the roundabouts, the vehicles yield to pedestrians. And you spoke of uh, roundabouts in Kitchener and Waterloo, and that's where I go to work every day, and you see the people crossing at the roundabouts. I'm curious as to why you wouldn't use those, because statistically, you say you're, uh, you're an engineer and you're all about stats and all that kind of stuff. Statistically, roundabouts are safer than crossing at a streetlight. So I'm curious as to why you would go all the way down to King Edward when there's multiple sections of Rust Acres Road that are much safer statistically to cross at. Thank you. Um, so, so I wasn't speaking about myself because I'm uh, 6'6", 250, I'm a grown man. If I'm gonna get across the street, I'm getting across the street. However, there's a lot of children. And uh, mm -hmm. perhaps, I don't know if your traffic offer, because in, in other cities I see SUVs where they do the little traffic, uh, you know, the traffic analysis of intersections and so on and so forth. Um, you guys have 40 kilometers posted. Ain't nobody driving 40 here, man. And, and you must drive on rest acres. You must see that people are not driving 40. And uh, I'm asking, the reason we're asking for a crosswalk is because of the speeds that the people are operating at. And the transport truck driving on rest acres, even driving at 40, takes considerably longer to stop, especially when approaching um, a roundabout. And it, like I said, it's not, this isn't particularly for adults who are a little more apt at crossing crosswalks. There's a lot of children, like I said, children and young teens that cannot cross safely. Uh, and, and I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not trying to change your mind. And when I made that mention, I didn't make that mention for me. I was talking about the children that have friends, the residents here have children that have friends across the way that cannot go and see them safely. I wasn't talking about adults. Adults can navigate these things and some adults would sacrifice their body to make a point in a, in a roundabout sometimes. But the point of the matter is, is I think 
that the only reason they you're right, they are safer. And I love roundabouts. I love them. I think they're great. Lights are a nightmare, but the roundabouts are great. But when you have an extremely long stretch where people decide come out of that roundabout and they step on that gas pedal and the kids want to go and see their friends across the street, I'm, 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 that's basically what I'm saying. It's about the children being able to cross safely, not about the adults. Um, and I didn't mean King Edward at the very end. There's a light before that. But yep. either way, it's quite, a, it's quite a distance. The paths are wonderful. You know, I walk there with the wife and the newborn all the time. And a lot of people use them. But it's the kids that I'm concerned with because now the kids need adult supervision to cross the street safely, even in the roundabouts, because people are not respecting the speed limits. So, well, I appreciate your concern over the children, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. Pam, do you have something to add to the conversation before we decide what to yes. do? Yes, yes. Thank you, Mayor Bailey. Um, I, I just, I'd like to maybe suggest to Council that this matter be referred to staff and that we can bring back a report to you in the short, short term on some options to move forward. Um, I will say that this could be a combined report from planning, development, engineering, and perhaps operations. Um, we could provide you some more details on how the development has evolved since 2015. Uh, but I can share with you a little bit of information on specifically the Riverview Heights subdivision tonight that may set your mind at ease. Um, I can uh, confirm that the county did pass a bylaw in 2018, and, and that was the execution of the Riverview Highlands subdivision agreement. And as part of this approval, council also approved uh, the traffic plan, including the location of all regulatory signage. Um, and that includes the no parking signage. Uh, for the subdivision. The subdivision was then uh, registered on title and the developer has now um, installed the regulatory signage. And this is the same process that's been used for all previous registered uh, subdivisions to date. However, uh, staff do believe that we can do better by changing this process so that the traffic bylaw amendment occurs immediately after registration of the subdivision agreement so that the regulatory signage, um, including no parking, can be installed prior to the first home occupancy and not years after, like this has occurred in the Riverview Highlands subdivision. This is one example of a future solution that we could bring forward as staff. Um, we also anticipate there are some long-term solutions um, in terms of policies in the new OP, which could direct uh, design guidelines for parking and so sidewalks. Um, we also have some medium term solutions, um, as Councillor Bell suggested, like the zoning bylaw amendment, which we would like to bring forward uh, probably early next year to Council to assist uh, with provisions related to parking driveway widths and utilizing our garages for parking to assist with ongoing issues. Um, noting that we'll also, also have to discuss uh, with our current developers about draft plan approved subdivisions. And some other short-term solutions, uh, such as bringing forward before the year end an explanation report and amended uh, traffic bylaw for the Riverview Heights subdivision. Um, and this could allow council to uh, make some considerations from tonight's deputation and some of the ongoing challenges in this area. And staff are currently working on this and we have some ideas um, for solutions to assist with on-street parking. And I, I should let council and the public also know that a lot of these challenges in the subdivision are uh, the result of a ripple effect from a townhouse block uh, that was approved with variances where garages were made smaller. And therefore uh, these, these spaces are not allowed uh, to have parking because of the size of the garages. And this was a grading error, um, which the developer recognized. And as such, we have had um, recently conversations with Lazani about creating additional guest parking in future blocks. Um, that would be blocks 97, 98, and 99, um, which could also alleviate some of the on-street parking congestion. So uh, Lazani is agreeable to this and we're working through these future plans with them now. So with all this information, I, I do suggest again that uh, staff could prepare a short report and get things in order quickly. Thank you, Pam. Does anyone feel comfortable about bringing forward a resolution to direct staff? Councillor Bell, seeking a seconder. Councillor Pierce, is there any opposition to directing this to staff? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Uh, opposed, I don't believe there was anyone opposed. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. And uh, I hope you all have a wonderful week, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mo moving on, please, to 403. Or 4.3, Sue Morton.
from the chamber with David Cash, a member of the chamber. Hello, Sue Martin. Hello, Your Worship. Thank you very much. So thank you to your worship and members of council. My name is Sue Morton and I'm the president of the Paris and District Chamber of Commerce. And I'm here today with David Cash, who's a member of our advocacy committee. And we're going to be presenting a broadband strategy proposal to council. And we thank you for your consideration. So our chamber supports business throughout the county of Brant. And we've been working closely with the county economic development group on a number of initiatives during COVID in support of local business. And we feel strongly that with more people choosing to work from home and online learning becoming a norm, uh, access to reliable internet is key. And we also feel this is going to be a major factor that businesses will consider when looking to locate in the county. So we hope to draw on the knowledge and experience of council members who have been involved in the SWIFT program and advocating on behalf of their constituents for the need for better access to internet. So having a cohesive coordinated action plan will ensure funding is targeted to the areas of greatest need and avoid duplication of efforts. And I'm going to turn the screen over to Dave Cash to present the proposal. Uh, well, thank you, Sue, and, and your worship and members of council. Thanks also for, uh, from my end, for having us today. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you advance two slides for me? Can you go to the next, and the next one, please? Thank you. So uh, as uh, Sue mentioned, high speed is really, really important. I think all of us know that by now. And they define high speed uh, as 50 megabits down and 10 megabits up. And they always talk about up to that limit. So you're not always going to get that, but that you should be able to achieve that. And that's called high speed or fast internet. But speed isn't always, uh, you know, the most important thing. It has to be available. And in some cases, it, it's just not for, for many people. It has to be reliable as well. Different technologies offer different advantages and disadvantages. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. And it has to be affordable. So, you know, there are a range of services available and, and cost can be a real factor for many businesses. And in, in our uh, county, many businesses are struggling with poor broadband. And I think council uh, is aware of that. Obviously the, the council has taken a number of steps which the chamber and, and all of us have noted. You have uh, a goal or a strategy for economic development that talks about the need for greater connectivity. Uh, member of council is, is, or council is participating through its membership on the SWIFT uh, board. And there was a recent uh, council resolution from Councillor Coleman on uh, requesting the province provide more funding, which uh, which is my next point, which the province has done. They uh, have uh, unveiled, I think it's 4.4, over 4 billion in funding in the last uh, couple of months. So there's a great deal of money flowing around. And, you know, the chamber is, is proposing here to, to put together what we call Brant Connects, which is a strategy and an action plan for how uh, we can ensure that the county both the urban areas and the rural areas are served with the best possible uh, broadband that, that we can do. So it builds on the existing efforts that, uh, that the county has already done. We're proposing it as a joint project between uh, the chamber and the economic development group of the county. And we're suggesting that you develop some short-term and long-term goals. Next slide, please. So what would a strategy do? I mean, just because you have a strategy doesn't mean everybody's going to get instant fast internet. But here are sort of the five key questions and issues that I think your strategy uh, should look at. You need to verify what's available right now in the county, both rural and urban. You know, where is it available? Uh, what is the download and upload speed that people are actually getting? How reliable is it? So during bad weather or 
if the trees get too big, do people lose their, uh, their internet? And is it affordable? And that's, uh, that's another thing we need to look at. A strategy should also look at the best ways to deliver you know, internet, both today and in the future. And many communities are now talking about future proofing. It's kind of a new buzzword in their strategies for broadband. What kind of infrastructure is going to allow the community to um, be really good in broadband in the future? And there's quite a debate about fixed and wireless and satellite. And the strategy can look at all of those options. And, and quite honestly, a mix of those is probably what a lot of communities land on. Uh, what are the roles for the players uh, in, in this field? The internet service providers, our ISP, senior governments, the County of Brant. Uh, some communities are moving forward with engineering standards for new developments requiring conduit, dark fiber, those kinds of things. So in new subdivisions uh, or a major road construction, they're putting the conduit in that in the future could be leased or rented to uh, uh, internet service providers as they put their fiber in. What are the most important short-term projects for broadband? Uh, is it your business parks? If the ISPs are moving forward with projects because they've been able to get government money, does it align with what Brant County's priorities are? And certainly a, a strategy like this, you would wanna work uh, hand in glove with the internet service providers and as they move forward, because they're the ones providing the service. And then what's the long-term uh, strategy for uh, broadband in Brant? Looking at remote work, home-based businesses, distance learning, virtual medical, and I didn't uh, put it in the slide, but one of the things that we're seeing is, is this growth in what they call precision agriculture, where a lot of farmers are now using uh, broadband and internet technology for planting and uh, soil analysis and, and keeping track of uh, what's going on in their fields. Next slide, please. So I, I, I put this slide in because there's been a few questions asked of us as we've been developing this proposal about the services that are available already. And I don't want to get too technical here because number one, I'm, I'm not a technical person, but I did go to uh, the mapping website that the federal government has, which shows the internet service availability across the country. And they have hexagons and polygons and all these wonderful things. But I wanted to show you two maps that I just produced uh, of part of Brant County um, that's sort of relevant for me because it's sort of the area where I have my home-based business. So on the left side is a map that shows internet availability and it shows it on roads. And the big red X is approximately where I am between uh, St. George, which is that area on the right side there where all the streets are, and Paris, which is on, would be on, this, uh, on the left on, toward the bottom of the map. So this mapping shows that apparently there's 25.5 availability, 25 de uh, megabits down and 5 megabits up on our roads out here in the rural area. And those brown blotches are these so-called hexagons of service that the internet providers uh, use. And you can see that some areas of, of this part of Brant County are covered by hexagons and others are not. So uh, even though some of the internet providers would say that we have service out here, uh, in reality, we don't. And I wanted to just share with you, I talked to a few of my neighbors who have their home-based businesses out here as well. And I asked them to do speed tests for me. And they uh, reported to me that they got 11 down and three up, two down, one up, 11 down and two up. So I'm not convinced that some of these mapping uh, details that have been provided are really telling the real story. And so a broadband strategy, I think, is needed to 
verify what services are where. There are undoubtedly areas of the uh, county that are unserved and areas that are underserved. And I worry that because some of these maps may show that we're already served, um, some of the funding that's available and some of the projects by the internet uh, service providers may pass us by uh, in the future. So, I, and I'd be happy to take questions on that, but uh, I wanted to just share these, these maps. The one on the right is just showing fixed wired connections, which um, was really to illustrate that most of the service out here is wireless line of sight. Uh, and you can see that the purple lines on the right show uh, just five down and one up of service. Parts of the village of St. George, of course, have better service. So on that uh, point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Sue, who's gonna wrap up our presentation with what we're looking for. Sue, next slide, please. Oh, you you I need to go to the next, uh, to the end, to the last slide. Man. Last slide. Yeah, yeah, there you are, perfect. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. So yes, our, our request of County Council would be to continue, as Dave said, with the existing efforts that are, that are already being, being put in place to support improved broadband. But we're also looking for to, to take up this Brant Connects proposal. We'd like your endorsement to create a strategy and an action plan. Uh, we want to establish a task force with, uh, with people that understand this, the technology and also with people that have been involved to date. Uh, and then we would be asking council to uh, ask staff to report back in a fairly quick time frame, two to four weeks is what we'd love to see on options available to move forward. So uh, a little birdie told me, I was in the waiting room, so I, didn't, I couldn't see what was happening in this meeting beforehand, but a little birdie told me that someone had difficulty with their internet getting on this meeting today. I think that's indicative of, of what people are dealing with in the county. Uh, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to, uh, to help business and, and constituents um, to, to have better access. And I think it's, it's something that's going to make people in the county very cool. appreciative. So thank you very much for your consideration. We'll take questions if you have any. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Councillor Howe is your first, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Sue and <clears throat> just Sue, for the record, the person who is having trouble connecting was in Newfoundland. So I'll be curious to see if the Paris and District Chamber of Commerce <laughs> stretches that far. Um, but uh, uh, my question for you, Sue, and, and I, first of all, thanks for bringing this forward. Any Anyone and everyone who's interested in, in finding solutions for better internet for, for the county has our attention. Um, so so I, I'll say that off, off the bat. My question for you is, you know, you are the Paris and District Chamber of Commerce and, and you are, you're clearly looking well beyond Paris and throughout the, the county wide need for better uh, internet connection and better upload download statistics. I, could you tell us a little bit more about, about how, how your organization is, is, is looking countywide? Um, because because we might be asked someone someone if we're going to be looking at at attributing resources county resources to to this uh, this joint effort um, someone may may ask about clarification on on you know it's the Paris Chamber of Commerce but so if you could talk about that a little bit please sure Dave I'm just going to first I'm going to hand this over to you Dave but just to let you know we've been getting feedback so we did send a survey out to our members and ask them for some feedback. And of the 12 responses that we got, we had one that was positive and all the rest of them told us that their internet is poor. And I, I think council may be aware of a gentleman by the name of Rick Sroka. Rick runs a home-based business out just outside of Scotland. And Rick's told me some pretty sad tales about his level of internet out there. So certainly we've seen it from all parts of the county. 
Uh, and we certainly have the data to back that up. And Dave, I'll let you speak to that a little bit more if you've got something you want to add to that. Oh, th thank you. And through you, your worship, to the councillor. We, uh, we, we looked at this broadband mapping and I, uh, that I was kind of reluctant to get into all these polygons and hexagons because I'm not sure that I'm, I'm very uh, adept at them. But um, there are parts of the county, uh, mostly the rural areas, that just don't appear to be served by, uh, by this mapping. So uh, this issue certainly um, is more than just uh, the urban area of Paris. And, and um, I, I live out in the rural area between the, you know, St. George and Paris, and I can tell you that it's, a, it's an issue out here. So I understand the concerns. This is this uh, type of strategy would would look at the at least from our point of view would look at the entire county, rural and urban, uh, farming and you know non farming. There's all kinds of, of internet speed and reliability issues that kind of span where people live and the various sectors that are out there. So there's there's no um, problem from from that side of things. I don't think anyway. Thank you. Councillor Ferrier, please. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad uh, you brought this up and uh, threw you to the delegation, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think also uh, Mr. Mayor did bring up Councillor McAlpine's laggy internet, which could be the poster child uh, for <laughs> this uh, endeavor. Uh, and I know Councillor Howes and I sit on the library board and we see it from a number of uh, folks who are, you know, we're getting off, getting on, getting off, getting on, slow. Um, and it, it is a competitive disadvantage and the numbers need to be better than even um, what some of the good numbers. I'm so glad you got into the data, the polygons and hexagons, because we've seen another issue, which is one, who cares if, if, if the speeds in Paris are generally okay, um, because we're one big county um, and we all work together and we all, all our businesses communicate with one another um, and as do our boards, et cetera. But we're seeing another challenge, which is the competition for internet and these home-based businesses and even from business to business when, you know, I have two kids doing school, if they're doing it from, from here while I'm in a meeting, you know, there's gonna be a lag even if I have decent internet and many parts of the county don't even have decent internet. So I know Councillor Miller, Coleman Chambers, Gatward, they've all been pushing on this in their areas as well. We all need to get behind this. Is there, is there anything we can do from, to help kind of gather support from the public? Because it seems like you've done some of that with the business community, but is there something we can do on, on the other end to get more of a, a groundswell of folks attuned to this? And I guess we can't do it through the internet, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, through you, your worship, I, I think we can certainly ask for input from the public. I think what you're gonna get is inundated with everybody telling you how lousy their internet is. Uh, I don't think that's gonna be, but I mean, if that helps, if that helps to gather more of that data for you, then I think that's something, Dave, we'd be willing to do. If you want to speak to sure. that as well, sure. Uh, I, again, your your worship through you to the councillor. The the uh, the public at large, I, I mean, they're using the internet in different ways, and and perhaps this strategy could include a public consultation piece where um, you could um, you know have a survey or something on perhaps on the county website where members of the public could share their, their input with their current service, their ideas for changes or, or whatever. We, we're kind of limited at, at the moment in terms of what we've been able to do, uh, admittedly more from a business perspective. But when you drive through residential areas, uh, and I'm sure you're aware, you, you, if you look inside those homes, you'll find a lot of home-based businesses as well. So these people wear different hats. They're kind of a business person part of the day and a member of the public at night, as, as I am right now, I guess. So, uh, you know, that might be one way to, uh, to flesh out more, uh, more input. But, you know, one of the things that, that, that we have to, I think, guard against is everybody wants everything faster and better right away. And, and of course, that's just not possible. Uh, however, with a strategy, you can kind of lay out a game plan, both short and long term to say, okay, you know, th these are the priorities that, that we'll get to with the internet providers now. And then this is where we're going down the road. 
uh, with service for um, better service for for the public for other things as well. And um, the internet service providers, I think, based on my experience, they're looking for this kind of roadmap to work with the local municipalities on so that they know uh, where they can uh, deploy their infrastructure. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Councillor Coleman and Councillor Miller? Mayor, uh, I, 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 I want to thank the chamber for coming forward and, and with your presentation. I, and I fully endorse it, Mr. Mayor. No question, just a, just a comment that I support it. And uh, at the appropriate time, I'll, I'll move it or uh, if it needs to be. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Councillor Miller, please. Oh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just thought to say, um, I, I, I don't have too much to say. I gave my input uh, to Sue and Dave earlier um, or late last week, but uh, I, I, I will say about the data you were sharing with us, Dave, as far as um, who has high speed and who doesn't. I think they, I think Swift has be, uh, better data on that. So um, I will endeavor to uh, see if we can't get that into your hands, okay? So. Great, thank you, Councillor Miller. Um, are there any other questions? Seeing none, Councillor Coleman, do you just want, oh, Councillor Bell? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Matt. Uh, question to Sue and Dave. Uh, what kind of structure do you see it, uh, of the joint uh, team between yourself and the council? What, how, I'm worried that we got lots of people looking at how we improve internet delivery across the province and, and locally across the county. Uh, what do you think you can do that is not already being done? And how can you uh, harness what is already being done to make it better? Uh, who, who wants to take that, Sue? Uh, yeah, through you, Your Worship, to, to Council. I, I think what we want to do is take all those pieces that are being done and, and put them together into some kind of cohesive strategy. So we gather up all the parties that have been working on this issue so diff for so long now, and, and certainly it's been an issue for us, I will tell you, four years anyway, we've been talking about it. So we wanted, we wanna bring all those entities together so that we have a cohesive strategy. We need those experts. As Dave, and Dave has, has alluded to, neither he nor I are going to be experts on technology. Uh, we want to have people from ActDev. We want to have the counselors that have been involved. We want some IT people with expertise from the county. I think if we can establish a task force of, of those bodies, they bring that knowledge and experience to bear. And we just, we've got Dave here to drive the whole thing forward because he's our guy. And, and I think that's how we make it happen. So Dave, I'll let you speak to that. Well, thank you, Sue, and uh, through your worship to the councillor, we one of the things we have to really, um, I think, guard against is is duplication and and fumbling all over everyone else. So, uh, again, I think uh, Sue's really said it well. We there's all these different uh, players and pieces in motion. There's this new provincial program. The feds are involved. Um, Swift is is also working. Um, so. I, I see a, a task force of uh, chamber and county folk, I, I don't know who yet, but to kind of uh, st steer and, and stick handle things to make sure that we don't fall into this overlap and duplication trap. And also to make sure that there's some kind of a game plan. So if an internet service provider uh, for example, comes to the county and says, you know, we're ready to go to, uh, we've got access to funding to tackle uh, your underserved areas. Um, do we, are we uh, clear that those are underserved? Are there other underserved areas? What's our priority? So it's kind of a document that uh, will help others to know what our priorities are. So I don't know if I've explained that well, but uh, that's kind of how I see it at this point. Yeah, Mr. Gary, if I may, just, just to, to say, I, I welcome that, those thoughts, but it is important to be sure that you are adding to, uh, to this issue in a positive way and not simply stirring the pot with many other people who are also working in this area. It's gotta be something additional to and beneficial from that, that this results in. So if, if we can go forward on that basis, I'm supportive 
of a motion that Councillor Coleman will bring forward. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Uh, Councillor Coleman, do you want to make a motion just to receive this as information? Do you want to refer it to staff? Yes, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, I would like to refer this back to staff for a report to come back. And then I think that sets the table and uh, where this can go. Seeking a seconder. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Looking for a seconder. Yeah, Councillor Bell. Um, and, and maybe maybe we could say that they wanted to, the staff could work with the with the chamber. Is that okay, Councillor Coleman? Yes, and I, and I think if staff could come back and, and at the earliest possible uh, at their, you know, to make it work for this, so thank you. Thank you, thank you. Councillor Miller, comment before we call the vote? Yeah, just, um, I, I thought Councillor Bell raised a good point. Um, you don't, <clears throat> you know, well, exactly the nature of this, but at the same time, um, we, we do know there is money's coming, um, so, it's, it's not to say that um, what this uh, task force does makes a difference or not, but at the same time, I think if we're prepared, uh, we certainly have a better shot of making the most use of any money that does come our way. So um, sometimes luck is when opportunity meets the uh, preparation. So maybe maybe we get lucky. Uh, and uh, so I, that's why I think it's probably not a bad idea just to have a plan in place. So I am supportive of it. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Okay. We have a thumbs up from the delegation, which should steer the vote properly. <laughs> All those in favor of Councilor Coleman's, any opposition to it? It's carried, thank you. Thank you, wow, Sue. Thanks thank very you. much. No, thank, thank you, you so people. much. Thank yeah. you, your worship. Thank you, councillors. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Sue. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 4.4, moving forward is Chuck Beach. And he's here for energy conservation and demand management plan. We have a thumbs up from the delegation, which should steer the vote properly. Yeah. All those in favor of Councilor Coleman's. <laughs> Any I just, to it? I just, I just heard an echo. Thank you, wow, Steve, thanks thank very you. much. No, thank, thank you so people. much. Point, point of order. I think he's, I think he's watching on YouTube. Okay. So we, he needs we to have, turn off his YouTube. Chuck. Chuck I just turned off my YouTube. Thank you. You're on, Chuck. Well, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, thank you so much for letting me uh, speak to you tonight. Uh, those of you who uh, don't know me, I'm with the Brantford Brant Earth Week Committee, and we arrange the tree planting events in the, the city and the county. And we also do school ground greening uh, in the city and the county. And in uh, the county, we've done Burford, Sacred Heart, uh, Paris Central, and Holy Family. Uh, however, I'm, renting, uh, I'm representing myself tonight, and I'm, I want to talk a little bit about climate change and your demand management uh, plan that you just uh, had a look at in the last few weeks, uh, because I'm, I'm very concerned about climate change and what it means for future generations. So, Heather, if you're ready. So I've, I've read over your, your plan and, uh, and I, I'd like to make some comments on it that all my comments are, are, are you know, based on the, the premise of uh, continuous improvement and, and, uh, and, and that's the gist of it and, and doing the best we can. So next please, Heather. So when I, I read over your plan, I had, the, the following comments. First of all, the county has a plan, and I think that's great. You've developed a plan. Uh, for the last two years, I've been after David and uh, Michael to have a plan because you just finished declaring a, an emergency, uh, a climate change emergency, but you didn't have a plan. Uh, and uh, you were actually out of compliance with regulation for a while. Uh, but you've got a plan now, a base to build on. In my opinion, the county is a leader in LED traffic light conversion that you did in 2017. In my opinion, the county is a leader in the adoption and support of solar energy with your uh, brand municipal enterprises. Uh, your new plan goes beyond provincial reporting requirements to include other uh, emissions such as tracking fleet emissions and, 
employee commuting. And in my opinion, the new plan is now actually transitioning from an energy conservation and demand management plan to a climate change action plan. And you're measuring your overall G, uh, greenhouse uh, gas uh, emissions. And I think that's outstanding. And further, your plan identifies some specific uh, energy uh, projects, energy savings uh, projects. And I think that's great. Uh, next, please. So I guess one of the important things for me is the objectives. And, and my overall comment on the objectives that were set forward in your new plan is that they lack specific measurable targets. And to me, uh, you're gonna make all your objectives because they're, they're, there's no specific measurable targets. So you're gonna make them all as, as the plan currently stands. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. I, I do believe you need stretch measurable targets and demonstrate true progress and leadership. So your, your 2014 plan, the 2014 to 2019 plan, has some very specific targets against which you, you measure yourself. And one of them was uh, decrease overall energy usage. That's the objective. And then you had a target, 15%. The other one you had was decrease overall GHG emissions by 15%. And finally, the, the fourth one was develop a one megawatt green energy generation. So these are all very specific measurable targets. Your new plan does not have that. And I'd like to demonstrate that if I could. Next. So the... Uh, First objective in the new plan is achieve increasing levels of energy performance to reduce environmental and economic, whatever, whatever. Continue to upgrade building envelopes and mechanical uh, electrical systems. So my comment, there's no specific greenhouse gas reduction targets. In five years from now, you could decrease greenhouse gas emissions by 5% and you would have achieved, you could say you achieved your objective. But right now, that's not good enough if you're gonna be net zero uh, by 2050. Next. So my suggestion is that you put in a measurable target. Uh, by the end of the five-year plan, the county will achieve a greenhouse gas reduction of whatever percentage versus 2021. On the building side, there is again, no specific measurable target. You say continue to upgrade building envelopes and mechanical electrical systems. Well, I can't say that that's measurable either. And so my suggestion for a target would be the county will reduce existing building emissions by 25% or the county will Im implement a green building standard such as LEEDS by 2023. Very measurable. Next please. Areas for improvement, uh, fleet uh, consumption, uh, more efficient usage of fleet to decrease overall fuel and electricity consumption. Good, uh, you know, the great thing is you're starting to measure it and you're including it. And you're also mentioning here that the work from home was tested. But my comment is there's no specific target and on page two of your most recent plan, it states further steps to mitigate the carbon output of these vehicles can be identified in the next version of this plan. Well, the next version of this plan is in 2025. And I don't think you can put this off for five years. If you are like other municipalities, fleet vehicles make up almost 50% of the overall greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and they will make a, a you know, by, by starting to address that now, they'll make a, a major dent in the county's overall emissions. So uh, I think the county should set targets for fleet emissions and conversion now. You've got to be, you're rotating your vehicles every year. You've got to be doing this now. And right now, the feds and the provinces, if they haven't already, they're coming forward with various incentives. Next, please. Objective three 
extend the life cycle of existing building stock, conserve resources, reduce waste, and reduce environmental impacts of new buildings as they relate to materials and manufacturing and transport. Well, I didn't spell targets right, but these aren't specific targets. Next, please. The storage and collection of recycles, recyclables. And then what it says is your objective that's in your document says to facilitate the reduction of waste generated by building occupants that is hauled to and disposed of in landfills. That's not a specific target. It's not a measurable target. So my suggestion would be that the county will divert X number of kilograms from landfills, or they will decrease the annual weight kilograms of solid waste going to landfills by whatever percentage. Next, please. Standard of development for construction. Create a master specification document and associated policies that are to be used when constructing any new facilities, buildings, or renovating existing facilities within the county of Brant. So my comment is, do you mean this is a green building standard? And if so, that's great. Will you be conducting a green standard built a green standard review like Cambridge did? I think Cambridge is at the have adopted for all. Uh, of their uh, city municipality buildings, they have to meet a LEEDS bronze standard. A suggestion, uh, you should put in a date when you're going to have that by, and it probably shouldn't be the end of the plan in uh, 2024. Next, please. So that, that concludes my uh comments on uh your objectives please set measurable targets uh areas for improvement uh under the uh provincial legislation you have to develop a plan every five years and you have to make an annual report what you're looking at right now is the annual report that's on your website you have to make it publicly available and you post it on your website so this is the the last annual report you did it's 2018 and this means nothing to most people and maybe not to yourselves. It's probably the emissions for every building in that you operate in the county. So my comment is that, you know, the only people who understand this or, or could use it would be a few selected members of county staff. That, that does not inform you or the public, I don't believe. Uh, next, please. So uh, areas for improvement annual reporting. If we are in an emergency, climate emergency situation, annual updates should, provided, should be provided to you at council annually on the progress. So if there's something not jiving right, you could make changes and, and uh, to get back on course. And, and I'd ask that you provide the public with an understandable report of the progress versus the targets. Next, please. So my recommendation, there's work to be done on this plan yet. So I'm asking that you don't approve the plan as written and you don't forward this to the province at this time, that you direct staff to develop specific measurable targets for each objective. And the council directs staff to provide annual updates to the council and the public in a comprehensible form. That concludes my presentation. Thank you again very much for taking the time. Thank you, Chuck. Um, Councillor Ferry, you want to speak to Chuck first? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Chuck, uh, I really want to thank you for your, your balanced, um, and the, the positives and negatives as you see them. Um, that said, um, I'm just wondering, I, I'm willing to make a, a motion later on um, that you may like, but I, I guess I have an issue with the the tying of this to the provincial piece. The provincial reporting is sort of something, it's my understanding that they want from us and they ask for some specific things, but yeah. we're not bound to do just that bare minimum. Even if we send this plan, like I agree with a lot of what you said. I just don't think we don't, I, I think we can approve this plan and still do more. And in fact, maybe do so in such a way that um, we can put um, a request to staff to put a lot of these requests into a budget process so that it becomes you know, a budget issue that uh, has some tangible resources attached to it. 
Um, would that be something that, like that, does that fit your understanding of this in, in terms of because I, I, I know we need to get a, a consultant to to help us with the GH uh, the, the greenhouse gas um, pieces and it's it's that part's really complex and we don't have that um, on hand at staff right now. So essentially, I, I'm willing to make a motion to refer a lot of this to the budget process to have some specifics um, and resources there. Um, but we can still approve this piece, send it to the province and do more than th what the province requires of us, which we, which you, as you stated in the beginning of your statements, we have a record of doing more than what the province asks for us to do in terms of some of these issues. Would that, would that maybe make sense to be able to do both things? Um, I, I hate to be intransigent. I mean, in the last plan, you did have measurable uh, targets. In this plan, <clears throat> you, do, you do not, uh, and and just to expeditiously for you know just to say you've got it in there and done. I'm just asking you to take the time to get it better because I think it's in all of our best interests if you have those measurable targets, stretch objectives to make us all better, and and to really recognize that this is an emergency. I'd rather you not submit it just because I'd like you to make it better for all of us. Yeah, well, we, we, it will come up in the, the committee report later, so I'll, I'll hold off on uh, any motions until that time. Thank you, Chuck. Any other questions for Chuck? Uh, Councillor Miller? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, three to, to Chuck. Chuck, um, I wish we had gotten your presentation a little earlier. Um, it came late this afternoon. Um, I did read it over, but I wanted to read it a little more in depth. Uh, just a quick question for you. Um, uh, um, greenhouse gas emission reductions through uh, the fleet, you're trying to reduce that. The only way I know how is either driving less <laughs> or not driving at all. And what's, and I suppose um, going, um, maybe with the uh, electric vehicles. Is, is there any other way of reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions from the fleet that you're aware of? Um, no, those, those are the one. I mean, the, the, big, the biggest ticket item is moving away from fossil fuels. Okay. And um, I'll tell you right now, uh, I've done a lot of reading, a lot of research, and I'm not so sure that electric vehicles themselves are greenhouse gas emission positive. Um, if you looked at the uh, tremendous amount of uh, environmental damage they do in digging up a lot of the, uh, the rare earths and whatnot in the use of those, um, I got to be honest with you, I'm not sure if that's the best way to go, but uh, like I say, um, just what I've seen. So I, ju I just wondered if you, if you had any other ideas. So okay. the, uh, I think what I've said is, uh, you know, we want to get away from uh, fossil fuels. I didn't say necessary electric, uh, I know that hydrogen's on the uh, uh, coming too, and a lot of uh, of the uh, car manufacturers, especially in Europe, are banking on hydrogen. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Mr. Beach? Seeing none, uh, are you prepared to make a motion now, Councillor Laferriere, or, or not? I'll make a motion to receive, but uh, when we when the committee report comes up, we can we'll we'll discuss there what what to do. Thank you. Seeking a seconder just to receive. Mr. Mayor, I have a motion that clerk has prepared. Oh, all right, all right. Maybe we, we um, should hear that first, Councillor Catward. Thank you. It's moved by myself, seconded by Councillor House, that the resolution regarding. The energy conservation and demand management plan be referred for consideration as part of the policy development and strategic direction committee. Uh, thanks, Councillor Gottwood. I think that's what uh, Councillor Laferia was, was thinking about. I didn't realize there was a prepared um, piece for that. So thank you. Uh, after you've read that, all those in favor of Councillor Gottwood's? Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. We'll speak to that when we get to it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, adoption of five on the agenda, please. The adoption of the minutes from the previous meetings, and those are meetings of July the 27th, 29th, 
August 10th and September 14 be approved. Councilor Chambers. Yeah. Councilor Chambers, do you have a- So moved, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Pierce. Any discussion? All those in favor? Is there any business or thank you? Anyone opposed? Seeing none, carried. Is there any business arising from any of those minutes, which is number six? Thank you. Seeing none, we'll move on to number seven, consent items. There are no consent items to be approved. 7.2 consent items to be received. Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moving myself, second by Councillor Chambers, the consent items, item one to number 10, be received as information. Thank you. Is there any, any of those that you want to discuss or pull out for comments? Seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And carried, thank you. Committee reports 8.1, Planning and Development Committee report of September the 7th, Councillor Miller. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And it's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Wheat that the Planning and Development Committee report be approved, noting that there are two recommendations after a very long uh, meeting that night. Councillor Laferriere. I'm just wondering if we could um, separate, uh, is it uh, 8.2 point? I'm just looking at the online piece here. The second recommendation, um, maybe to have Michael discuss it a little bit on what we just spoke about with Chuck, the 2021-2024 Energy Conservation and Demand Management Plan. Okay. Or can we have him speak to it now, um, maybe? Yeah, we can, he's here. Is That's not on the planning. Oh, sorry, am I on the wrong? I'm using the web portal, so I might be on the wrong one. You're on the wrong <laughs> committee, yeah. So I'll, I'll save that for what is it, eight point two? I think, yeah, I think yes. so. Sorry about that, everybody. That's okay. All those in favor to receive the report? Thank you. It's carried. Up together here. 8.2 is the Development and Strategic Direction Committee report, Councillor McAlpine. Councillor McAlpine, you're on mute. Yep. It's uh, moved by myself and said by Councillor LaFerry that the Policy Development and Strategic Direction Committee report of September 14, 2021 be approved. Are there any questions to Councillor McAlpine's report? Councillor LaFerry. Everything I said last time about uh, the second recommendation, if Michael could speak to it at this point. Thank you. And Michael, Michael is still here. So, hey, Good evening, uh, Your Worship. And uh, I can speak to a couple of the, the comments that the de delegation brought up around the energy management plan, and I'm happy to answer further questions or, or give council some, some further thoughts. But so I think the, what the delegation said is that there were no measurable targets. Uh, in the plan. I would agree with that. So this is a high level plan. It really would fall into the typical category of a, of a short of a short horizon master plan. So it gives us some some high level guide um, guiding objectives to go and aspire to. Uh, it doesn't have what I would call hard targets. So for example, a 20% reduction in energy usage by a certain date. And the delegation mentioned that the 2014 plan did have those. And, and there's some, some differences between this plan and the 2014 plan. So the 2014 plan, we had some energy audits. And I, I'd maybe ask council to think back to that time in 2014. That was the what I would call the golden age of the Green Energy Act. Uh, and some of the councillors that were on council at that time remember Mr. Noble and, and his team coming in and talking about this. There was a lot of activity and we could get grants to do energy audits and, and, and companies would come in and do them for free with the hope that they could get some down, you know, some downstream business. So, so we had a package of energy audits on all sorts of parts of our business that we could use to build targets. But we don't have that right now. There's no, there's no public money for us to do energy audits. So 
our approach in this plan would be to set high objectives to, to set an objective such as to improve energy uses of, of buildings and then go away find some projects that we think are feasible do the background work on those projects uh, determine what the gains on greenhouse gas emissions and energy energy usage would be uh, from those projects and then report them um, so it's almost kind of doing it a little bit reverse than we did it the last time um, I don't object to the fact that that setting targets are, is a good thing if you can do them but setting meaningless targets which is pr probably what we would be doing now we'd just be picking numbers okay we're going to try to hit 20 percent and and this in in, in in reduction of of energy or greenhouse gas emissions or diesel fuel usage, but we don't really have any hard science to back those up. So how our plan, we view it, this is, this again, it's a high level plan, it's at high level objectives. And then every year you'll see us with a suite of projects in the budget that we'll be using uh, to, to you know, achieve these high level targets. So I'll give you a couple of examples. In this year's budget, uh, one project you're gonna see is for us to hire a, a consultant or an architect to do a, a building envelope design for the Burford Administration Center, which we think is one of our, our higher energy use buildings. That, that project will then help us determine A, what we can achieve and B, what the, what the outcomes of that project will be from a savings perspective. Then in the 22 budget or the 2023 budget, um, you'll see that actual budgeted project. So again, this year, 2022 budget, you'll see a consultant's you know, a request to hire a consultant to do all this work, 2023, when then we'll put the project in. We visualize it's probably gonna be a new roof, a new windows and a building envelope um, um, restructuring because it's a pretty porous building. So you know, that's, that's how we are attempting, or intending to use this plan to, to uh, find meaningful greenhouse gas emission and energy usage savings. Uh, and, and I think I think it's a it's a good plan personally, and, and I like it. I think if you want us to go away and try to make up some numbers, um, we could do that, and we can try to, to put some math. But we don't have a lot of hard science to go for because we don't have that those those um, those um, uh, energy audits that we we were able to get very effectively and efficiently uh, back in that in that earlier era. So I hope that that you know answers the questions that were posed by the by the delegation on why we haven't set hard targets. And again, because we don't have them. I just wanted to finally maybe one, make one comment. And the, the, there was the delegation commented, and I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that he did about our green energy program, our solar program, because it was very successful. But it's also one of those programs that we, when we originally set out on that project, we didn't set any hard targets. It was a very high level approach. We said we were gonna embark on a bunch of green energy projects. We made some very, very high level assessments on what those projects were gonna be. Most of them are ground mount projects. Uh, as the FIT program evolved, and it evolved several times in its lifetime, uh, those projects evolved into mostly to roof mount projects. They went from being large FIT projects on the ground to small FIT projects on roofs. It involved partnerships that we didn't, we did, we didn't see, uh, including the creation of a community energy cooperative, which brought community investment into those projects. And I think that's a good example of, you know, council in, in, at its time made a wise decision to set a high level objective and not really commit to a bunch of specific projects, which we kind of were thinking about, but most of those projects would never have come to fruition. So anyways, those are my comments, uh, your worship, and, and hopefully uh, they help council uh, in, in determining what to do uh, with this plan. Uh, we are recommending it for approval and, and we think it's a, a plan with some good merit. Thank you. Councilor Laferri, do you want to re respond to that and then Councilor Chambers? Yeah, just, just asking about uh, two specific things. And I, I thank you for that, Michael. And I don't want to put targets that we won't reach and targets just to feel good. Um, but we did declare a climate emergency as well. And I know everybody, that was a unanimous passing and we, we spoke to it quite a bit. Um, something we were doing for a little bit of time, and I know the pandemic kind of shifted that, was we were doing a triple bottom line on some of our reports. And we had talked about that in depth and you, you'd like that. And I know other municipalities are really impressed by that. Is that something we can maybe bring back? For those who don't know, a triple bottom line is, you know, there's a socioeconomic and a, and a environmental bottom line that becomes part of reports. And we, we had done it a little bit and then hell broke loose quite literally and figuratively. So I'm wondering if that's something we, we could do and, and or if on the budget every year, could we have a section on environmental impact? specifically in the proposed budget would that be because then there's a yearly reporting piece but it's put into the budget process it's it's something that 
you know, people can then speak to the budget delegations. Could I, I'm wondering, again, I, not to make a motion on, but maybe to explore that, would either of those dovetail some of the suggestions and have some accountability and some tracking we can then do from budget to budget or from report to report? Michael? Yeah, through through you, Your Worship. And so, first of all, you know, I'll uh, I, I'll admit that I like the idea of including the triple bottom line in our reports, and it's something the clerk and I have committed to uh, to drafting a new report template for council's consideration. And I did do a couple sample reports that I did take to council with that, and I thought it was a good exercise. It's going to need a little work on our part to coach our staff on how to go about that, um, but but we will uh, we will circle back on that. So. Uh, I think that's a that's a good it, it helps us to keep it from from our own as the authors of the reports to keep in mind what the impact social economic and environmental impacts on the recommendations we're giving to council and it also helps council how to keep track of that as well so 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 I, there's no no requirement we will bring something to council with a with a draft uh, a report template so and on the budget piece is that something that could be worked in through you mr Mayor? Through, through you, Mr. Chair, if council wanted that, I, our budget, we're already doing the budget templates now, so it's, it'd be a bit late to, to transition this year. We're, we're, we got our hands full with, with the budget, given all the other things going on. So, But I think uh, when the budget's done this year, if council wants to make a recommendation to, for us to in, include that in future budgets, we could certainly, uh, cons we'd, 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 we'd be fine with that. Uh, Thank that's you. at council's discretion. So. Thank you. Councilor Chambers? Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Bailey. I, I think my question is, is uh, through you to Michael, it's very similar to what Councillor Laferriere uh, has suggested. I, I'm just uh, noting, I, I think uh, the delegation uh, suggested a, a regular reporting uh, uh, of various things to, to Council. I'm just wondering if, if Michael can uh, comment on how he sees uh, Council being uh, continuously informed on progress uh, in terms of reports, etc. Michael, yeah, true. through you, Mr. Chair. So the one thing I do, I do uh, full heartedly agree with the delegation would be to provide more consumable annual reporting on our energy management plan to council. So we will commit to doing that. I, I thought it was in the report and I thought I saw it there that we would provide reporting and we have to do some annual mathematical reporting on on, on energy usage uh, through the provincial tool, I believe, but but uh, you know providing a, an abbreviated and, and consumable uh, plain language annual report, I think is quite quite uh, doable for us. It would be a good um, a good vehicle for council to track this, and it would be good for uh, for the public to see what we're doing. So so yeah, I'm in, I'm in full agreement with that. We can commit to doing that. Um, one thing I did also want to mention the the, the discussion about uh, you know the climate emergency. Um, and, 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 you know, this is, it's, I, I would, I, I should mention, I mean, this, this report and this plan is one piece of our response to that. There are other pieces that, that council, I think, you know, is seeing that's, that, that feed into our response to the climate emergency. The official plan has a big part of how we're going to address climate change in the broader community. This is, this is so, solely focused on us as an organization, how we use energy and how we try to save energy, um, various forms of energy, which, which results in the creation of greenhouse gas. Um, the official plan is a big one. Uh, the Parks and Recreation Master Plan is actually a big piece of, of our, uh, our, our climate change because it's got a big natural lands uh, securement and preservation strategy within it. And it probably needs to uh, beef up a bit that natural lands piece in our, in our Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Um, and there's, there's other, we just talked just earlier tonight about um, about um, internet, and I think you know, good internet to to the to our community has a has a positive impact on 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 climate change because it allows people to drive less and to communicate more eff effectively and efficiently. So so there's a lot of pieces to our our response to a climate emergency, and I think as these pieces start coming together, we can sew them together uh, in that annual report to council as well. So. Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, commenting on the energy conservation demand management plan. Um, it seems to me that we as a county have kind of picked the low hanging fruit. Um, we put the solar panels in because um, they made sense financially. They were financially viable. Uh, built, doing a building envelope makes sense because you actually save more in the energy costs than you do to fix it up. 
Uh, same with lighting. Lighting was a no-brainer. Um, you make that money back in two years. So, so we picked the low-hanging fruit. And I'm just wondering, um, are, will we get maybe through, Mr. Mayor Michael? I, I don't know if this is going to happen or not, and I don't know how I could ever philosophically support it. But um, do, do you see a point where um, we're going to be looking at maybe spending two dollars to save a dollar in energy? Is, is that is, are we far away from that? Michael, so I think the question is: Are will we will we start making unwise investments? Um, you know, like spending two dollars on on in something energy, yeah, yeah, in energy and, management, yeah, yeah. And so I would agree with that. You know, the initial plan we did harvest the low hanging fruit, street lights being the obvious one. It was a no brainer. Um, lighting was a really big one. First of all, there was a ton of incentives in lighting in, in, over the last period, and um, and it was there was it was it was it was very easily achieved. You know, I think that the, the more difficult fruit, if you will, to harvest are things like the building envelope. So the, the Burford uh, Administration Center building envelope is something we've talked about for years. It's a very expensive project, but we know the savings are there. And then there's some 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 other benefits to it as well. There's a comfort analysis. It's it is it is an I worked out of the building for five years. It's a great building. I love I love working there, but it's an uncomfortable building. It's 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 not an easy building to to work out of from a from a comfort from a climate comfort perspective, so so there's some upside to to taking that project on as well. But I think some of those projects are the are the the stretch goals for us. They're the harder projects. They're going to be more expensive, but they'll have a a, a good good value too. I hope we don't get like I think we would have to make a real unwise decision to start making a building envelope investments that had a negative return. You know, in in that case. The more likely scenario is we'd be coming to you and suggest we surplus those buildings and uh, invest in new buildings. And we, you know, you'll, you're going to probably be seeing a report from us in the near future that's going to actually address a topic on a, on a building that we think is at this point where we shouldn't invest in it. So, um, so hopefully that that answers the question. I, I would hope that we would not be making unwise investments, and we'd be looking at other investments to make that are that are that are wiser. So, yeah, no, I, I like to say I. I don't know how I could ever support that, even though I, you know, I, I love to save energy. And uh, last thing I'll say to you, Michael, is uh, spray foam. Just keep that in mind. Spray foam. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Um, are there any other comments to, to Michael regarding the delegation at Chuck Beach? Seeing none, are you prepared to vote to receive this report? Yeah. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Carried, thank you. Eight, thanks Michael. 8.3, the paramedics um, report, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Pierce that the paramedic services committee report of September 15th, 2021 be approved. Are there any questions for Councillor Ferrier? Councillor Miller? Very, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Very quickly, uh, through to Mark. Mark, uh, maybe you know, maybe you don't. Um, would we still, if the ambulance wait times improve significantly at the BGH, would we still need to put on an additional ambulance for next year? The, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, with population growth, with um, some of the issues uh, related to the pandemic, well, not over, but there's, there's different levels and changes to why people are calling for an ambulance and more people calling for it because of uh, vaccination statuses uh, in, in the city and county being better. Um, so we saw some lower numbers at times uh, due to the pandemic, but we are seeing both still issues with the pandemic, but also uh, people utilizing the hospital in ways. And people have also been um, sicker in some ways because of um, not seeking out treatment during a time where they were worried about COVID-19. So there's a lot of different balls in the air. We're always going to need some more ambulance service with the growth in both the city and the county as well. And um, I think we kind of heard uh, evidence of that in the previous delegation from the hospital. Yeah, I, I see some here too. Yeah. Yeah, Councillor Wheat. Here to Mark, <laughs> by adding on, you're, you're being very progressive and not reacting, you're being progressive. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wheat. Are there any other questions before we call the vote? Seeing none, we'll call the vote to receive. All those in favor? And it's carried, thank you. 
8.4, the Administration and Operations Committee report. Councillor Pierce, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Coleman that the Administration and Operations Committee report of September the 21st be approved. Thank you. Are there any questions for Councillor Pierce? Councillor Bell? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if we could separate item 10, I can't vote on that. Right, you did say that. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, noting that Councillor Bell has a conflict. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. No opposition. Thank you. 8.4.1. Councillor Chambers. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mayor Bailey. Uh, this uh, is one of the quirky little things with our reporting system that if a recommendation or a, um, an issue doesn't uh, get resolved at the committee level, it uh, can be brought forward at the um, council level. And, and this is one of those situations. Um, it, the, uh, I'll, I'll begin by saying the recommendation there that uh, was circulated isn't <laughs> my wording. Uh, I had asked um, Michael Bradley, the CEO, to uh, craft a, a recommendation uh, if uh, indeed we could support this uh, request from the delegation. So the, the wording is, has, has been crafted by Michael so that uh, if indeed it does pass, then we're not in violation of any of the uh, development charges by law issues. So uh, it, it is a, a lengthy and perhaps wordy resolution with a few whereases that basically uh, outline the uh, uh, perhaps the mitigating factors in, in this uh, uh, situation whereby a development charge was charged when indeed there was uh, uh, perhaps reason why it, it, it shouldn't have been charged, but our bylaw says it had to be, and the request is that it be refunded. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll leave the wording as it is uh, in and of itself, but I did want to make mention uh, it's, it's very important to realize what uh, development charges are, and I think that uh, has a, an, an incredible bearing on whether we want to refund uh, the charge or not. Our development charges update review, the first line uh, describes exactly what a development charge is. And I just wanna read that uh, so that we're all uh, working under the same uh, definition. Uh, the, the, it, it says this, the County of Brant imposes development charges to recover capital costs arising from the increase in needs of services related to growth. The important words there are capital costs related to growth. Uh, it, it's important not to conflate property taxes with development charges. Property taxes are totally different and development charges are uh, charges related to growth. So if I look at 19 Highway 53, uh, going back over the years, as long as I can remember, uh, which is quite a while, there has been one house and one family living at 19 Highway 53. Uh, in, in 1952, the year I was born, there was one house one family. 20 years later in 1972, one house, one family. 1992, one house, one family. 2002, one house, one family. 2012, one house, one family. And in 2022, there will be one house, one family. The point I'm making is there is no growth. It's been constant, one house, one family, no growth. So if the development charges are charges that 
are made to recover capital costs related to growth, it's very difficult to reconcile the fact that we're charging almost $20,000 in this case for growth when there has been no growth. The mitigating factor here is that the property was vacant for a few years, I think not quite seven, but almost seven. And our development charges bylaw has a clause of stipulation that it's five years that we allow before we deem growth to occur. Well, it, it's an arbitrary number as the resolution describes. It might just as well be, uh, or it could just as well be 10, or seven, six, or whatever. We were told some municipalities have less than five, some have more than five. A lot of them have five, and that seems to be the, the going number. It's hard to explain why it's five, for example, and not six or seven. And there's really, it's, it's hard to define or defend an arbitrary number. And that's what five is, an arbitrary number. It's not really based on anything. It's just a number of years that we use. So the resolution uh, outlines some of the extenuating circumstances whereby if we want, we could use another number in, in our minds uh, and allow the, ref the refund to occur. Uh, and again, if, if this is a growth charge and there is no growth, then I have a hard time defending charging someone $20,000 almost for growth related expenses that they have not or the property has not incurred over the last 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years. It's always been one house, one family, no growth. Uh, some people are, are worried about setting a precedent. Well, the precedent I want to set is that we be fair and equitable to our ratepayers as we should be and, and as we are, and not in this case, I think, gouging them with a $20,000 expense for something that hasn't occurred. And I, I feel that uh, if we are to to be rigidly bound by the arbitrary number of five years, then maybe that's a precedent we don't wanna to set to be so rigid that we can't be fair to our ratepayers. Uh, and it, it has been suggested perhaps that when the land was vacant for five years, it was charged at a property tax rate of less than the residential rate. In this case, it, it was when the house was uh, uh, taken down, it reverted to agriculture. Well, again, you can't conflate property taxes with development charges. The property taxes related to the use were fair every year and consistent with everybody else. We can't use a development charge to recoup uh, taxes where it maybe could have been residential, but was agriculture. We can't do that. That's actually against the law. <laughs> so you, you can't use that as a reasoning for not, uh, uh, for taking money from someone if it's not related to growth. So those are my comments, Mr. Mayor. And I, I'm hoping that people will be uh, set the precedent uh, that we already have or continue the precedent of treating people fairly and not charging them something in this case, a, a, a very large amount for uh, growth where growth 
essentially has not occurred. And uh, thank, thank, thank you, Councilor. That, that's my, 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 my comments, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Pierce, then Councilor Howes, then Councilor Bell. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you speaking to the to the motion. Well, I guess, well, first of all, I can't support the motion. I'm going to start off with that, and I'll give you my rationale as to why. Um, Councilor Chambers, you state that, you know, the five is an arbitrary number, you know, could have been four, could have been six, could be 20. So what you're saying is we need to be fair to the, to the, to the, to the, to the rate payers, to the taxpayers. Well, I, I think we are being fair and we're setting the same boundary for everybody. I know of at least two lots in Ward 3 that are vacant lots that are residential lots with no homes. One of them hasn't had a house on it, I'm going to say, for at least 15 years. So if we're being fair to that person, that means that if now all of a sudden somebody wants to come in and build a house there, which would be infill, to a lot that's there, a residential lot that has been sitting bare for at least 15 years, isn't going to take any additional development charges, is that fair to extend it to 15 years? I think we have to set a number. And the number, yes, could have been five, could have been four, could have been six, but the number we chose was five and it was well-documented five. It wasn't, as we said in that meeting the other day, five years in one day, five years in two weeks. This was several years after. Yes, I understand COVID was in the middle of that, but this is several years after that, that time limit has surpassed. So I think it's, it's critical to have a time limit in there. We can still be fair in the sense that if it's a week, Sure, but if it's a couple of years, no, I can't support that. And the same as I'm saying with the, as I say, I know of at least two lots in Ward 3. So if all of a sudden they come and they wanna build on there, do they say, well, you know what? Um, there's, there's no additional development that's gonna happen here. The lot's already there, the services are already there. So why do I have to pay development fees? We have to pay them because that is the rule that we have set. So I appreciate what you're saying, but I, I can't support this. Thank you. Councilor Howes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you um, to Council Councilor Chambers, at, at the very beginning of your presentation tonight, you said if an, is if an issue isn't resolved at committee, then there's an opportunity to bring it up at council. And I, I thought this issue was resolved at, at committee. I thought, I thought there was a vote, at least one. Um, but I, I won't dwell on that, um, but I found that whole process confusing. I, I do have a more specific question related to the background of this, of this uh, story, and, and you gave a lot of very good detailed information. I have a question for staff, probably for Pam, if that's possible. And that was, I was taking note of the issue about how this property was demolished through a controlled burn through our as a training exercises by the county fire services therefore it did not require a demolition permit i'm curious if 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 it had been if that had not been the case and this had been a traditional demolition with a demolition permit would that have at all impacted the 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 triggering of this of the development charge Does, just that quick question. Thank you. Councilor Chambers. Oh, Pam, sorry. Sorry, through, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, our Deputy Chief uh, Building Official, uh, Adam Rosenberg's on the line. He may be better uh, to answer that question. Hi, Adam. Good evening, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. I think, I think the whole question or the, the demolition permit is would only give it a specific date uh, when it was demolished. So I would I would say if if a demolition permit was issued, it, it really wouldn't have changed anything other than to to pinpoint that specific day in 2013 when it was demolished. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. You're next. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I wanted to get um, staff to just comment on a comment that Councillor Chambers made about growth. Uh, he made the comment that there's been no growth in that property. But it was my understanding that when we charge development charges, it is to provide for growth 
in the county, not specifically the house that is paying those development charges. So that's my first question. If somebody could just clarify that, it would be helpful now I can move on. Thank you. Who, who's going to speak to that, Pam? Uh, again, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Heather Mifflin is on the line and I think she would be best to answer that. All right, Heather. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, the de development charges is are raised to cover growth throughout the county. So growth in all areas of infrastructure, be it recreation or um, like roads infrastructure. So it covers growth throughout the county as it grows, as the pressures of growth increases the need for the facilities and for the infrastructure. Thank you, Heather. So I, I sincerely hope that since 1952, uh, when Councillor Chamber was born in 1953, when I was born, uh, there has been growth in the county, and I can see it. So I think that's a fallacious argument on the part of, of, of the Councillor Chamber. I, I worry about precedent in this case. Um, I think we are setting ourselves up for a real problem if we accept this significant variance. The variance could be measured as much as three years beyond the time limit, or even six years beyond the time limit. That's between 60 and 100. And 20% variance. We're setting ourselves up and our staff for a flood of claims for grants, reimbursements, excursions, exceptions. And, and that further increase, further increased in my mind, a growing belief that I want to stamp out that if you push the County of Brant Council hard enough and long enough, you'll get what you want and recommendations will change. So I, I really am very strongly opposed to this. Uh, as uh, Councillor Pierce said, we set a, a, a rule of five years. It may not be perfect, but it is uh, in line with the majority of other municipalities. The issue here is about keeping to our rule set. And I, I think if we think about work we do in the Committee of Adjustment, where we deal all the time with minor variances, this is far from being a minor variance, and I do not support the proposal. Anyone else want to speak? Councillor Miller? Uh, yeah, Councillor Chambers read what I was going to read. <laughs> so um, Robin sent out that uh, piece on um, development charges. And, and I thought it was, I thought it, it's good that the first part about talking about why we have development charges and that's the paper growth. So um, I, I won't repeat what he said, but I will, uh, I will ask for a recorded vote. Thank you. Councillor McAlpine? So I, I was just going to add, I had sent out the response to some questions I had from Heather. Um, I can't support it. And part of my reason is, and just a response to the, uh, the question of development charges, the, um, what we're seeing here is actually negative growth when they remove the house. So then when that happens, theoretically, those extra taxes that were covered by that home at that time then had to be re covered by everybody else in the community. So now what we are seeing by another house being put up there and we can date the demolition now to 2012. Um, so it was eight years when the new owners took control of that property. So even at the time that they purchased it, it was three years past when the building had been demolished. So I think we'd just be open up to a lot of problems if we do not, um, if we approve this. So I can't be in favor of this motion. Any other comments before we call the vote? Council Chambers? Just, just again, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, with, with regard to what a development charge is and what we are charging uh, the, the property owners in this case, and, and, and we all know, uh, and we subscribe to the, the theory that the growth has to pay for itself. And, and growth uh, uh, is occurring all the time. And to suggest that it's since 1952, the year I was born, <laughs> uh, that no growth, is, I, I didn't say that at all. But what I did say is that this particular property where the development charge that is, uh, placed on the property to 
uh, cover capital costs related to growth is uh, in, in my mind unfair because they are not contributing to growth. If I took my house down and built it back up again, uh, I'm not contributing to growth and I don't have to pay a, a development charge. If, if there's a vacant lot that's been vacant for 15 years, if that lot has had a house on it for 100 years prior to that, you could make the argument that uh, there is no growth. And if your comfort level is, is five years and you're rigidly adhering to an arbitrary number of five years, just because our bylaw says so, it, it's, it's, it's almost like when I was a kid, I wanted something and my mother said no. When I asked why, she says, because I said so. Uh, and, th and that's not a, a good explanation or a reason for uh, to, to not allow something. There has to be a reason. So if, if you're saying you're not going to support this because that's what our bylaw says, then tell me why. Don't tell me, uh, tell me why our bylaw says five years and why it doesn't say six years or seven years. There has to be a little bit of latitude uh, there. And, and I haven't heard why it's five years instead of six years. Why isn't it seven years? Why? Uh, please don't tell me uh, you're not gonna support this because that's what our bylaw says. Well, our bylaw has to be based on something rather than an arbitrary number. And in this case, the number is arbitrary. And I think we recognize that it is an arbitrary number uh, because some municipalities have different numbers. So it, it's not a calculation. It, it, it's just a, a benchmark that we've set. And uh, if, if we're so afraid that this is gonna open the floodgates, this is the first time I can recall a request being made uh, to offer some latitude uh, after a house has been demolished. It doesn't happen that often. I can't remember it ever happening where we've, we've had a request uh, uh, to refund development charges based on the fact that it has gone beyond the arbitrary number of five years. So let's be fair uh, to these people. It's an incredible cost to them. And uh, uh, I'm not prepared to say you can't have it because our bylaw says so. I'm, I'm prepared to look at the, the, uh, the mitigating factors and the extenuating circumstances that are listed in the resolution and say, yes, uh, uh, th there's no growth, growth, you haven't contributed to growth uh, and it would be unfair to charge you a charge that we levy uh, on people because of growth. So again, I, I, I don't want to repeat myself and, and the, the vote will be what it is. So that, that's my uh, concluding comments, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Chambers. Councilor Bell and then Councilor Pierce. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I think Councilor Chambers is trivializing our whole system of bylaws uh, to, to pick out one item and say this is arbitrary when staff have gone through a process and have identified what is the appropriate number to include in this bylaw, and we as a council have passed that, as we have passed many bylaws, what we're doing is opening up ourselves to a flood of uh, attacks on not just this bylaw, but every one of the bylaws we've ever passed. And I, I would make a comment that earlier this evening, I asked one of the delegations uh, about the advice they got from lawyers and real estates when they were making real estate decisions. And I do wonder what the applicants saw, uh, the applicants sought and were given in terms of information regarding the uh, uh, development charges bylaw as it applies to their situation. If they weren't advised by their lawyer or by their real estate agent, then, then they have been remiss in, in being advised. And it's not the council that should pick up the, the tab on this one, or the county should pick up the tab. I think the individual um, applicants might have a better chance of talking to their lawyers and their real estate agents and say, you gave me poor advice or no advice at all. 
Councillor Pierce. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you um, to Councillor Chambers, I'm going to use an analogy here of uh, downtown parking. The bylaw says there are parts of downtown that you can only park for 24 hours. There are bylaws that say there's parts of downtown that you can only park for three hours. You could say those are arbitrary numbers. Somebody could say, why can't I park in the three hour lot? Why isn't it 24? Those were the numbers that were taken. So if somebody parks in that lot more than three hours, by law can come by and give them a ticket for parking in there. Same type of thing. The, the, rules, are, the rules are there and they're set. If, we, if you would like to make a motion to change that five years, that's a different story. But that five years has been set. It's been there for a while. Can, can anybody on this council explain to you why that number five was, was chosen? I don't think we can. I don't think that's a fair question to ask because you know that nobody around here can on this, on this council right now can tell you the answer to that question. But the fact of the matter is, it is five years. That is what's in the bylaw. So that's what we need to stick by. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. That, that's the end of that. We're going to have one vote. It's going to be a recorded vote. There won't be a second vote. And Heather, if you could make that vote, please. And don't make it look hokey. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Miller? Uh, I vote yay. Councillor Coleman? Yes. Councillor Gatward? Yes. Mayor Bailey? No. Councillor Wheat? Yes. Councillor McAlpine? No. Councillor LaFerriere? No. Councillor Howes? No. Councillor Bell? No. Councillor Pierce? No. Councillor Chambers? Yes. The motion is defeated by a vote of six to five. Thank you. Can we move on to number nine, please, staff reports? Councillor House. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Bell that staff report RPT-21-251 regarding the uh, public washroom addition downtown be approved as printed. Any discussion? Councillor Miller? A quick question. Um, I think it's a brilliant location. Um, just to be clear though, there will be no access to the, uh, the rest of the council buildings, correct? That, that's right. Oh, Michael? No, that, that's correct, yes. Yeah. yeah, like you say, just to, whoever come up with the idea, kudos to them, so great idea. Councillor Howes? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just, just another follow-up quick question. Um, and while I support this uh, in a big way, the, uh, and I, I appreciate staff um, for taking the time to put this forward. This has been a long time coming. Um, because we will be asked, um, ha has there been some decisions <laughs> made already in terms of hours of operation and, and security, that kind of type of thing? It's obviously not going to be a 24 hours thing. Um, I just, just because we will have somebody ask us, uh, might as well ask the question now. Michael? Through, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, your worship. No, I haven't really given, we haven't got a lot of thought to hours of operation. I think we can chase that out over the next few months. I think broadly, I, 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 I have anticipated that it would be open probably from an 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. type of time frame, And then the self-locking doors would lock it up um, at that point. Um, in terms of frequency of cleaning, I'll be chatting with staff about that a little further and determining you know, what's the best way we're going to get them cleaned. And um, you know, beyond that, we've got a few things to figure out, but we got a bit of time to do it. So. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Laferriere. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to maybe it's direction the staff or actually maybe just to Councillor Bell, uh, a polite ask, but um, can this um, result after it's done, I'm pretty sure we're going to vote for it. Could this be moved to the BIA? Because I know a lot of BIA members I've been asking for this for quite some time, most of them politely, some of them not. Um, but if uh, Councillor Bell could maybe ask the new BIA president and their communications people to share this with all of their contacts, um, I think I think it would be really well received and maybe a little context as to, you know, we tried other things, we looked at other costs and um, just that this, this is coming in and to direct the, any conversation to you or to council. Because I, I think the BIA 
is in part responsible for advocating on this, but also we're responsible for hearing that and acting on it. Thank you. If I could respond, Mr. Mayor, for sure. Yes, of course, I will do that. The BIA are in receipt of the council report. Uh, they're very supportive of the idea, as you know from your time on BIA. This has been a long running issue and we're glad to bring it to a resolution. Any other comments? Call the vote, all those in favor? Opposed, it was unanimous, thank you. Moving on to 10.1, that's the resolution. Uh, Councillor Bell, you have this? Yeah, uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor McAlpine that the County of Brant supports the resolution of the town of Oakville, requesting that the province of Ontario address the underfunding of the OHIP insured eye care and enter into negotiations to fund these services. Are there any questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried? 11.1, uh, Councillor Laferriere. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Gatward that the resolution proclaim, proclaiming 2022 the year of the garden and June 18th, 2020 specifically as Garden Day be approved as printed. Any discussion, concerns, comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried? Thank you. Thank you. Number 12 is other business. Councillor Bell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to give a little bit of context here. Uh, I would like to share some concerns regarding a potential safety issue with the uh, stormwater management pond at 23 Cedar Street. The stormwater, stormwater management pond is a part of the condominium development at 23 Cedar Street. It's been designed by the developer NSW and will be ultimately adopted by the condo board. However, the handover of the pond, pond to the board has not yet been completed. The NECP, the Ministry of Environment, Climate and Parks, Parks, is that correct? Approved the stormwater management pond design. And whilst it's essentially a dry pond and water will only irregularly be held in the pond before it filters away, uh, NECP accepted that a fence was not required However, the builder installed fencing on the south side of the pond for safety reasons. They had a concern that reversing drivers might inadvertently reverse into the pond. The other three sides remain unfenced. As you're aware, Cedar Street is currently under reconstruction. And with the recent heavy rains, the pond has partially filled with water as well as debris from the reconstruction. Water has not drained out as per the design of the pond. And as such, the combination of a road under reconstruction, pedestrian traffic walking closer to the pond and residual water in the pond, a number of residents have raised concerns regarding the potential for in particular children accidentally or otherwise getting into the pond and not being able to get out. I recommend that a temporary fence be erected to make it more difficult to access the pond and to highlight the potential dangers. This is not a permanent solution. It's not actually the problem of the county, but given that we are working there and nobody else is taking charge on this, uh, I think it lands back in our court. And I believe it should only be in place until the county works on Cedar Street are completed. And ultimately the longer term determination of the need for offense should reside with the condo board, MECP and NSW, the developer. Just as a side note, uh, stormwater management ponds in similar locations, uh, that being close to residents and adjacent to local roads on Dundas Street West and on Hanlon Place are fenced. So with the approval of council, I would like to pre present a resolution tonight and I will seek uh, council's agreement to waive the notification period that will allow county staff to erect a temporary fence that will remain until our reconstruction work is complete. And I fully acknowledge this is not normal for us to take actions on private property, but I believe there are extraordinary circumstances in this situation. And I could read out the resolution if that's appropriate, Mr. Mayor. Taking a second or first, Councillor Bell? Uh, Councillor Pierce? 
You have a seconder. Do you want do you want to read the resolution? Councilor? I'll read it. I, I've given the essence of it, but I'll read it. Whereas a stormwater management pond is being constructed on private lands at 23 Cedar Street in Paris, which is only partially fenced. And whereas the county of Brant is currently reconstructing Cedar Street, which has disrupted normal pedestrian patterns. And whereas the current state of this newly constructed stormwater management pond represents a hazard to local residents due to recent rains and the unvegetated condition of the pond slopes, which is compounded by the construction activities on Cedar Street. Therefore, the county staff be directed to install temporary snow fencing around the stormwater management pond at 23 Cedar Street, and that this fencing be left in place until the pond slopes become fully vegetated and the road construction on Cedar Street is completed. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments or concerns? Councillor Chambers? Just, just I'm wondering if, if the word uh, snow in snow fence should be more appropriately, maybe safety fencing, snow fences. Uh, it could be a, a ramshackle and, and in many cases are, but safety fencing I think would be better. Yeah, I, I have no, no hesitation to, take, to make that change. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it sounds like a great idea. I have no issues with it. Uh, well, no, I should say I have no issues with it. <laughs> um, it sounds like common sense, but um, I have to ask um, if we go ahead and do this, put, you know, fencing up on private property, something happens, are we now part uh, liable for, for anything that happens? Uh, maybe I could pass that to Michael. Uh, or or Jody, Michael, Jody. Through you, Your Worship. Uh, good evening. Um, I I can't give you advice in public session, but what I would recommend is having uh, a consent from the property owner and having an indemnification um, and insurance requirements for that that construction. So. Um, I'm certainly happy to work with whatever agreements need to be in place in order to get that fencing put in, in, in place. Councillor Miller? Just following up then, um, is, would, would we need to make that part of the resolution or, or is that to be understood? I hate having things to be understood, but um, is that part of the resolution? So through you, Your Worship, if you added a clause into the resolution that permitted me to work with the uh, operations department to craft that type of agreement. I don't have to then come back to you to get um, yeah. authorization to go ahead and execute that, to get that prepared and executed. If that could be included, then that just saves you one step. Okay, and, and maybe maybe Mr. Mayor, we could get the uh, the mover and the seconder to put that friendly amendment in. Yeah, Councillor Bell, you're okay with that? Uh, I'm more than happy, yes. Yeah. Councillor Coleman? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm having some concerns with this because I, I, right off the start, Councillor Bell mentioned this is private property. And I, I think this is up to the, uh, the, the, the owner of the property to look at this. This is not a county situation. Uh, uh, even though we are doing reconstruction on Cedar Street right now, uh, we did not uh, uh, create the stormwater management fund. Uh, uh, how far are we going to carry this? We're going to carry this on to uh, every other situation where there could be construction, where whatever. So I, I'm having some concerns on this, and and I cannot support it the way it is right at the moment. All right. Any other comments? Concerns? No. Before we call, the, I'd like to have a recorded vote, please, Heather. Okay. Are we ready to vote? I, I believe we are. There's no other questions. Okay, Mayor Bailey. I support it. Councillor Wheat. No. Councillor McAlpine. Uh, no. Councillor Laferriere. Yes. Councillor Howes. Yes. Councillor Bell. Yes. Councillor Pierce. Yes. Councillor Chambers. Yes. Councillor Miller. Uh, I'll support it as amended, yes. Councillor Coleman. No. 
Councillor Gatward? No. The motion is carried uh, seven to four. As amended. As amended. Thank you. Moving on to 13, please. A motion to go in camera, Councillor House. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Gatward that County of Brant Council convene in camera. Thank you. Are we going to take a break or are we going to go right through? Right, th right through? Councillor Wheat? Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Mayor, I had my hand up, but that's okay. You didn't see, you can't see everything with this situation that we're under right now. But I apologize. I had an item other other business and I apologize for not getting on getting it on the agenda. I'd like to bring it up if with your permission. If not, I'll bring it up next month. Let, let's bring it up next month, Councillor Reed. Okay. Uh, just to give you a heads up, it's regarding Remembrance Day. So I've got a, um, another month because we meet in October, which will be before Remembrance Day. All right. Um, if it's regarding Remembrance Day, it is kind of time sensitive. Maybe you should speak to it tonight then. Would, whichever you desire. I'd like to make a motion that to honor our veterans that in, for the month of November, that our crosswalk be repainted to honor our fallen veterans. And I'm suggesting like when you, when you look at the Remember State colors, they're black and red. So I'm making that a motion that crosswalk be repainted, be repainted to honor our veterans for the month of November. Which crosswalk are you speaking of, Councillor Wheat? Well, the, the one in downtown Paris. It's the only one that's ever been painted. We don't have one in St. George. Well, the crosswalk, the Barnes Dance at the corner of Mechanic Street and or William Street and Grand River Street is a crosswalk that's just newly painted. That so was for, like that was yes, I understand that was for the month of, of, of June. But I'm just suggesting that we repaint it for the month of November to honor our veterans in Remembrance Day. I don't even have a seconder, so it could die right there, but I'll need a seconder before you can go forward. Seeking a seconder to, to paint the pride uh, crosswalk in Remembrance Day colors for how long, Councillor Wheat? I would say for the month of November. Okay. <laughs> There's no sense doing it for one day. November 11th. So not, I would say for the month of November. Seeking a seconder for Councillor Wheats. Councillor Bell. You're muted, Councillor Bell. I would second it, but I'd like to comment to it if I may. All right. So you have a seconder in Councillor Bell, and then Councillor Bell wants to speak to it. Uh, my comment is that there are two crosswalks in the high street in Paris. I think I see no reason why we couldn't do it on the one closest to the cenotaph, which would be more appropriate. And I wonder whether Councillor Wheat would accept that as a friendly amendment. I, I would Wheat. take, if you're referring to me, Mr. Mayor, I would take that as a friendly amendment. Councillor Bell. Yeah. Uh, Councillor LeFerrier. No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't support painting over one that we've painted with some permanent paint, but I would definitely support painting over the one that's on the, the mechanic side um, closer to the cenotaph as a something to do. Because again, there's a cost, there's like a three to $5,000 cost depending for the painting piece. Um, and if we're gonna do it, I mean, I think the whole point should be that it's permanent and we don't need to divide one group and against another group or, I mean, you know, I think about a gay veteran going, why, why paint over one to do the other? We have other crosswalks. So the only thing I would suggest though is um, when the downtown master plan takes effect and that becomes a mini roundabout, if that's still within the plans, that consideration to continue the sort of veterans walk uh, piece of it be, be put into that planning. Um, and I, again, that doesn't have to be part of the resolution, but just to keep in mind that that's not always gonna be a, a, um, a, a crosswalk as we see it now. So we'd have to do something at that mechanic side to, to, to make sure that if we're gonna do this as a permanent thing that we do it in a way that makes sense. Councillor Wheat? I didn't suggest it as a permanent thing. I just spent for the month of November. 
That's fine. No, but I think it's a huge cost to just do those sort of things for a month. And there's a whole process. We, a couple of us, I think Councillor Howes and myself and Mayor Bailey were there when the wee hours of the morning when they were putting in the the one on the on the middle walk and it is quite a process and there's a cost to it so but but they can be permanent so why why erase something and replace something if you if you don't need to and we have the two councillor house uh, thank you um <clears throat> mr mayor yes i i uh i fully support the idea of, of doing it on the crossover closest to the cenotaph and and i i i think rather than you know look at every other month a different color for this this crossover I, I i think it would make sense for it to be um since it's adjacent to the 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 uh, cenotaph it, i agree with mark's point just do it permanently or, or at least as permanent as permanent as it is before the the downtown master plan digs the whole street up anyway any other comments? Councillor Chambers? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I'm not gonna support it. Not that I, I don't agree with the sentiment that uh, fallen uh, veterans need to be recognized, but there, there are, I think, more appropriate and, and better ways to, to do just that. Uh, we talked a lot about precedent uh, <laughs> uh, this evening and, and we've, we're establishing precedents on everything we do here. But uh, uh, we're going to run out of crosswalks uh, for all the, the, the good deeds that we want to do across the county. There are, there are dozens of things I can think of that, that I'd like to uh, recognize and honor and, and, and respect. Uh, and, and the good old days of, of proclaiming and, and, and posting and, and those kinds of things seem to be gone. Now we have to paint uh, crosswalks. And, we don't have enough crosswalks to do all that we the good things we need to do. So it's uh, an expensive proposition. Uh, it's just another uh, another uh, expense to the county. And uh, I I don't want to be accused of not supporting the, the veterans. Uh, just as I I uh, uh, wouldn't think that anybody would do that because of my record, but uh, not going to support it. It's uh, unnecessary and we don't have enough crosswalks and enough paint to do all the things we want to do. Thank you, Councilor Chambers. Uh, Rob Walton, you're on the call. Through you to Council. Um, um, we'll do whatever Council wants us to do here, but we're in a very difficult time here to do this. We're really almost past painting season. Hate to tell you that. Um, last year, when we did the crosswalks late, you remember how well the paint lasted in the winter? Not really very well. Um, so there are there is quite an expense to this. There's also the whole idea of what is visible and isn't visible. Like we've you know we've got the other ones that are very, very visible colors. Um, how do you make that work? Um, there are some challenges here. I, and we'll, we'll do what you want, but um, I just you know this was a surprise to me tonight, so I had no time to prepare for it. Sorry. Any other comments, concerns? We have a motion on the floor. We have a seconder. Uh, all those in favor? Mayor Bailey. Yes. Sorry. Just trying to confirm the motion because um, we had a few things suggested as friendly amendments and I'm not sure which of them are accepted. Um, so, because there's the two issues of, are we doing the crosswalk closest to the cenotaph and is it going to be permanent or just a temporary thing? I, I believe it's uh, the, the crosswalk closest to the cenotaph and it's for one month. And it's going to be in the colors of what J John, red and black. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's what it is, Heather. Thank you. Councillor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would rather see a donation to the Poppy Fund, which supports veterans, then painting a crosswalk. I um, certainly support our veterans and the fallen veterans who gave the ultimate sacrifice. But the Poppy Fund, which is a campaign throughout November, um, I'm sure would appreciate 
a donation or each of the legions a donation from the county and that would be <clears throat> more cost reasonable than a painting on one crosswalk in one part of the county so that's my opinion on this um, crosswalk thank you thank you councillor gatward before we call, the, I, I can't imagine that anyone would think that any elected official would not support our veterans, no matter how this vote goes. I can't imagine why anyone would think that, Councilor Chambers. So feel free to vote your, your will, Councilor Chambers, because no one would think that of any of us, I don't believe. Anyway, we'll call the vote. Oh, Councilor Coleman, Councilor Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and in light of what um, uh, General Manager Walton has said about the painting and whatnot yet. Um, I, I just want to, and I, I, I would like to support Councilor Reed's idea, and, I, and, and he did let me know earlier today what he was thinking about, but in the essence of time for the fall months right now, and if it's not going to stick to the pavement the way it should do, it just looks bad on us. Maybe we need to defer this and 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 think about it for next year and whatnot and 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 then and see somehow other way we can honor our veterans for for, for this year or whatever. But I, I don't want to see it put the paint down and the damn stuff doesn't stick very long. That's uh, that does not look good on us. So uh, I just want to we should ask for deferral, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Coleman. Councilor Miller, you had you you want to yeah, speak? I, I, well, pretty much what Councilor Coleman said, if this was uh, August 28th, I'd probably support it. I just know uh, we get a lot, a lot of rain in the fall. Um, and and uh, yeah, no, I, like I say, I, I hate to hate not to support it, but time is, is late. So I can't support doing it this year. So could certainly support it for next year. Councilor LaFerriere. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think too, um, when we did this with the Pride Walk, I mean, it was brought up a year and a half beforehand. Community groups reached out to us. There's precedent in other communities. I'm supportive of it in theory, but again, I, I'm thinking about what Councillor Gatward said. On top of the safety issues of maybe red and black, specifically painting something black that's supposed to be visible, um, I'm wondering if in the deferral piece too, we, if that's how we go, we, we also maybe reach out to different veterans groups and legions to see what they want, because while I think really well intentioned, let's make sure like we had LGBTQ groups, we had downtown business associations, we had the library, we had a bunch of different organizations, and we did uh, we gave staff time to research the safety aspect, etc. So I'm wondering if if we also maybe just do a bit more of a community outreach on you know at, let's ask veteran groups how they want to be honored um, to get the, some of that clear input as well, um, and maybe not in time for this year, but not not to say we couldn't in the future. Bradley, you're, you're on, you want to speak to that? Thank you, Mr. Chair, or your, your worship. I just wanted to uh, uh, um, further something that Mr. Walton said. So I, I, you know, I think council should remember the reason we did those raised crosswalks was to increase, improve uh, pedestrian safety in the downtown area because it had been flagged as, a, as an issue. And I think our paint choice needs to be very cautious to make sure, and, and I think it's, it's been touched on, that we make the we we then detract from pedestrian safety because part of those raised crosswalks was not only to 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 for them to function as a speed hump, but also to function as a visual um, uh, attractant to drivers to see that it's across a, ra a crosswalk area, and color can have a lot of of impact on that. So again, I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, Mr. Walton touched on it, um, but again, that is the reason why we put those those uh, raised crosswalks in. And I, I think we don't we got to be very cautious about doing things that could then make them less safe, so. Councillor Wheat. I, I would like to withdraw my motion because I'm not, I didn't do this to create an argument among council and divide things. So I'm going to withdraw my motion. Thank you, Councillor Wheat. Councillor Howes, you have nothing more to say then? I need permission from my seconder, Mr. Bell though. He, he's, he's got his hand in the air. He supports you withdrawing it, thank you. Uh, we have a motion uh, to go in camera. It's been seconded. Uh, we're going to go in camera right now. Can you take us in camera, please, Heather? Yep. One sec.
Did we all make it? Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. Can I ask that you do everything but 14-3 because that's where I've got the pecuniary interest and then uh, I can leave and you guys can do 14-3? Yep. Thank you. 3 Everyone's here? Okay, we're going to bylaws. Councillor Miller, we're going to do everything but 14.3, please. Um, 14.3 as in the third reading of bylaws? I'm not no. sure what you mean. 14.3, the corporate, the, um, the bylaw. Um, I've got a pecuniary interest of 14.3. So I'm just asking to do all the other ones and then you guys go back to 14.3. Point of order, it's, it's, it's bylaw number 98-21. Right, but it, it's about the unions. It's, it's... Yep. 98-21, that, that's, that's- Just for how it reads. <laughs> yeah, 98-21. Okay, so um, first reading bylaws, boom, by myself, second by council, we read that bylaws 96-21 to 109-21 be now read a first time, excluding bylaw 98-21. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried? Second reading, please. Yep. Uh, second reading bylaws moved by myself, second by Councillor Wheat. That bylaws 96 21 to 109 21 be now read a second time and all clauses and preambles be adopted, excluding nine, uh, bylaw 98 21. Thank you. Are there any questions for the second reading? Seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor of the second reading? Minus 98-21. Third reading, please, Councillor Miller. Uh, third reading of bylaws is moved by myself, second by Councillor Wheat, that bylaws 96-21 to 109-21 be now read a third time, uh, signed and executed. All those in favor of the third reading? Opposed, and it's carried. Thank you. Good night, Councillor Pierce. Good night, all have a great evening. Yeah. Um, we'll now do 98-21, please, Councillor Miller. Absolutely. Uh, moved by myself, second by Councillor Wheat, that bylaw 98-21 be now read a first time. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Second reading, please, Councillor Miller. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Wheat, that bylaw 98-21 be now read a second time and all clauses and preambles be adopted. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Are there any questions to 98-21? Seeing none, all those in favor? And the third reading, please, Councillor Miller. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Wheat, that bylaw, is, that bylaw 98-21 be now read a third time, passed, signed, and executed. All those in favor of the third reading? Opposed? Carried? That wraps up the bylaws. On to number 15, please, which is the adjournment and the setting of the date of the next meeting, which is Tuesday, October the 26th. Uh, motion to adjourn, please. Councilor LaFerrier, that's great. Thank you. We stand adjourned. See everyone tomorrow at the OPP station.